everybody. It is 2.03 p.m. on Tuesday, April 9th, 2024, and I would like to call to order this regular meeting of the Washoe County School District Board of Trustees. Clerk Rodriguez, can you please do roll call? Yes, Madam President. Vice President Mayberry. Here. Trustee Nicolette. Good afternoon. I'm here, President Smith. Here. Trustee Westlake. Here. Trustee Woodley. Here. Trustee Church. Here. And our student representative. Here. Right, Madam President, we have a quorum. And welcome to our student representative. It is so nice to see you here today, Aravel. Yes. Okay, so we teach our children and you may also have been taught this when you were a child to look for the helpers. Has anyone ever taught you that or have you heard that you look for the helpers? You look for the people who are there and smiling and making life easier or better and even though you're with them you may not know who they are but they make a big impact on our day. And so the person that I'm going to invite to do the pledge is a district staff member um, of 18 years. She has worked at multiple schools before coming to the main office, including Glenn Duncan, Robert Mitchell, and Desert Skies. And when you all walk through our main doors, you are greeted with a smile, you are greeted with assistance, you are greeted with a connection to any number of the things that you may need at that moment. And the person who greets you with a smile and help every single time is Ms. Judith Harrington. So would you mind, Ms. Harrington, in leading us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Thank you so much, Ms. Harrington, for doing such great work out in our visitor center and always helping everyone that comes to our board meeting. So thank you so much. Yes, and Ms. Harrington had no idea we were gonna do this, which is, which is what makes it half the fun. <laughs> now she has to go back out there and greet everybody. All right, everyone, uh, that closes item uh, 1.03 and we'll go on to 1.04, uh, our land acknowledgement. Every community owes its existence and vitality to generations from around the world who contributed their hopes, dreams, and energy to making the history that led to this moment. Some were brought here against their will. Some were drawn to leave their distant homes in the hope of a better life and some have lived on this land for more generations than can be counted. Truth and acknowledgement are critical to building mutual respect and connection across all barriers of heritage and difference. We begin this effort to acknowledge what has been buried by honoring the truth. We acknowledge that some of our educational structures are situated in the traditional homelands of the Washu, Washo, Nukmu, Northern Paiute, Niwi, Western Shoshone, and Nuwu, Southern Paiute peoples. We pay respect to their elders, past and present. These lands continue to be a gathering place for indigenous peoples, and we recognize their deep connections to these places. We extend our appreciation for the opportunity to live and learn in their territory. Thank you. So with the closing of 1.04, we now close all of section one and we move on now to section two, our consent agenda items. Uh, prior to this meeting, um, I had a request from Trustee Church to pull items 2.19, 2.21 and 2.22. I'll circle back on those in a moment, uh, but did anyone else have any other items that they were interested in pulling? Okay, seeing none, um, we will go ahead and we will pull item 2.19, 2.21, uh, but since 2.22 has already been heard once before, uh, that's the change on board policy 4110. Uh, Trustee Church, do you have a second on that? I haven't asked for one, I didn't know. Uh, that's been our board policy for almost a couple years. I might dispute that, but at any rate, I don't have a second. 
I'm 100% sure that if an item's already been heard once before, it can definitely be pulled. You just need a second to pull it. Okay, since there is no second on that, we will absolutely proceed with pulling item 2.19 and 2.21. So we'll pull those ones over to the side. And now we will proceed as a group um, in relation to items 2.02 .02 to 2.18 and then 2.20 and 2.22. Um, seeing no lights on, first I'm gonna do public comment. So if there's no questions on those items, JJ, do we have public comment on any of those items? Kaylin Evans for item 2.08. Welcome, President Evans. Hi, my name is Kaylin Evans, president of the Washoe Education Association. I just wanted to take a minute to, to kind of reflect and highlight this particular item in the agreement that was reached between the WA and the Washoe County School District. As many of you know, last year we uh, um, engaged in a historic agreement around the use of salary savings from the district to support um, current staff. Um, we were able to reach uh, an, another agreement this year on this, and, and I think what's really important that we highlight about this is there are no other districts in Nevada who are using salary savings in the manner in which we are, which is to support our current employees and the impact that short staffing has on the entire school site. Um, I do a lot of uh, work and, and talk a lot with folks at the national level too, different presidents of associations across the country, and all of them are being impacted by short staffing, right? Like that's, that's a national issue. But we've talked about these, this sort of agreement that we've been able to come up with uh, at the district level, at our level, and none of them have this. And so I don't wanna say that nobody's doing this, but I can be very certain that we are absolutely, um, you know, setting a trans setting in this in this arena with how we're using um, these savings to support our current staff and it's bigger than just you know the monetary value of these things this is how we show our folks that we appreciate them and that we're going to do everything we can and that's what builds culture and and, and employee engagement and employee buy-in to an organization is built off of culture not the other way around and so i do also want to make sure that i i give a big thank you to Mark Mathers and Jeff Bazo in the business office, um, all of their, you know, all of the folks in there, because it's easy for us to say, hey, let's do this, but then we have to figure out how to make it work and how we're going to implement it. Um, and it's a, it's a tremendous amount of work for their department. Um, the collaboration with that team uh, really, really showed that there was a shared effort and vision on how we need to go about doing this. Um, and then, you know, a shout out to my executive director, Summer Kay. Um, she worked uh, closely <coughs> uh, with Mr. Pick on the back end and making sure that the language was there. And so it really was a, a shared uh, and collaborative effort. And I just wanted to thank all of you for you guys making this a priority and, and continuing on in, in this way. So thank you very much. Thank you. Cole B. Reardon for consent agenda item 2.20. Welcome, President Reardon. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Colby Reardon, President of Washoe School Principals Association. I am here to speak on consent item, agenda item 2.20, the approval and adoption of the negotiated agreement between Washoe County School District and WESPA. Over the last 11 months, our negotiations team has worked alongside the district's negotiation team to develop an agreement that addresses the needs and concerns of our administrators. This collective bargaining agreement reflects an effort aimed at fostering a supportive working environment for all of our administrators. As the president, I endorse the proposed CBA and I urge you to approve this today as well. By doing so, you will demonstrate your commitment to our administrators. I encourage you to recognize the importance of this agreement and fostering positive and productive working environment for our administrators who directly impact and enhance the educational outcomes for our students in Washoe County School District. I would also like to close today with some acknowledgements. I would like to thank WESPA members for their ongoing support, patience, and understanding throughout the negotiations process. I would like to acknowledge our associate chiefs for their unwavering support, visibility, and continued guidance and acknowledgement of our work, of our administrators, that come to work each and every day. 
A thank you to WESPA and Washoe County School District's negotiations teams for their work with this collective bargaining agreement that supports the administrators and acknowledges the work that goes into the schools and departments each and every day. And lastly, I want to thank Dr. McNeil for returning as our interim superintendent. Um, your support and everything that you do for us does not go unnoticed. Your collaboration with our stakeholders shows a true appreciation and acknowledgement, and we thank you. Sorry. Don't be sorry. Thank you. Don't be sorry. Thank you so much, President Reardon. The board received an email from Kristen DeHaan related to consent agenda item 2.20. Thank you. All right. Before I bring it back to the, the board, um, I do want to um, add on a bit to what President um, Evans said about the labor savings item. Um, I, I hope to have the opportunity to talk more about it, but um, U.S. Uh, Secretary of Education Miguel Cardona and Acting Labor Secretary Julie Su were in town and we had a roundtable about this. And when they heard that this was one of the things that our board had done, because we've previously done this, it's, it's ahead of us as a vote to consider doing it again now, but they were not just fascinated with this, but they were thrilled with it. Um, they told me personally that they had takeaways from this meeting that they think are the model for the way that school governance can be done nationally. So I just want to echo that and let everyone know at this uh, dais here that that's the kind of recognition that the Washoe County School District is receiving nationally among different groups with the way that we're working with our teams to honor them, uh, to compensate them, and to create a culture of respect and growth um, in the organization that we have. So on that note, um, just as a reminder to everyone, I'll be looking for a motion to approve 2.02 .02 to 2.18 and then 2.20 and 2.22. So moved. All right, motion by Trustee Woodley. Is there a second? I can second that. Yeah. Okay, so a motion and a second. Um, is there any discussion on the motion? There is. All right. Thank you very much. Um, obviously I have to vote no on the consent agenda based on 2.22 uh, because I cannot pull that off and discuss it. Uh, basically what that does is each of us represents about 100,000 people within the district and by allowing a trustee to represent those 100,000 people, it allows that trustee to act in his or her best interests and thoughts for pulling an agenda item to discuss specifically the appointment of a leadership. This is just a top tier leadership position in a public forum and then for a public vote. Uh, because that uh, is taken away here by requiring two or more, I think that's a step in the, dis in the direction of non-transparency, uh, so I have to object to that. And I do dispute, it's not worth beating up here, but whether this has been common practice for how long, but I'm going to have to vote no. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Trustee Church. I can confirm that this is definitely board policy. All right, so all those in favor of the motion made by Trustee Woodley and seconded by Vice President Mayberry, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. Nay. All right, motion carries. Thank you so much, colleagues. And now we'll go ahead and we will move on uh, to the first of two pulled items. And we'll start with item 2.19. This is the approval of the appointment of Jose Gomez to the Council on Family Resource Centers as a community representative to fill the remainder of the current term and for a full term ending June 30th, 2026. This makes this now uh, an item for possible action. And we welcome Dr. Paula Marca, and I will defer to Trustee Church as the trustee who's pulled the item. Thank you very much. I am looking at the uh, material supporting this. It looks like Mr. Gomez is highly, highly qualified. This is a position that's commonly sits vacant because not everybody wants to be there, so I applaud that. But the question I have that I couldn't find, how many other applicants were there? There was one, other, there was one applicant, Mr. Just, Gomez. Mr. Gomez, okay, that changes everything. Uh, then the other question, in looking at the application, it says page one of three, page two of three, and then I don't find page three of three. Can you explain that, of his application? I cannot explain that. Uh, I don't know if Ms. Batchelder can. Um, it's probably redacted information that's not relevant. 
I believe the page you're referring to it just has some notes on it. It's there's nothing from the applicant on it. It's just part of the form. Okay, I, it's part of the form, and I think it now and in the future should be on. I mean, it's page three of three. It should be on there. But I will point out, just just so the public and the board members know, it states on page three of three quote. Applications for committees of the district are public documents, period, end quote, as well as many other paragraphs that deal with that. And I think the public has a right to know that. But with that, I'll, uh, I'll approve that motion, uh, or I'll, I'll uh, not object to Mr. Gomez. Thank you. JJ, do we have any public comment on this? We do not. Fantastic. All right. Well, then I will be looking for a motion to approve item 2.19. So moved. Second. All right. We have a motion by Trustee Church, a second by Trustee Woodley. Seeing no lights on for discussion on the motion, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. All right. Motion carries, team. Now let's move on to item 2.21. This is the approval by the Board of Trustees to provide authority to the Board President and Vice President to negotiate the employment agreement between the Board of Trustees and the new incoming Superintendent of Schools for the Washoe County School District and to retain Platt Law Group to assist them in the negotiations and drafting of the employment agreement between the Board of Trustees and the new incoming Superintendent. This is now an item for possible action. And I will again defer to Trustee Church as the trustee who's pulled the item. Thank you very much. Uh, number one, I note uh, Platt Law Group is apparently going to be helping us with this. I think I saw their quote was 225 an hour, which is extremely reasonable for legal services. So that's I wanted to put that on the record that I think that's gr that's good. My concern, having been on this last time, my recollection was that at our open board meeting we provided the general guidance to the president uh, and, how, and vice president on how to negotiate this. So I'm not comfortable just giving a carte blanche, go ahead and do it. I think that's a board um, responsibility and I understand afterwards we can vote yes or no, but that's my recollection. If I'm wrong, set me straight. You are right and we already did that because remember everybody, we talked about um, salary ranges, we talked about um, not a commitment to, but an openness to different topics around re relocation reimbursement, we talked about topics potentially around longevity structure. So we've put um, some of the bumpers on the bowling lane, if you will, um, and then what happens next is very much um, affected by who this board may consider extending an opportunity to. So the bumpers are on the bowling lane, but that doesn't mean that there wouldn't be unique negotiations that take place um, between the negotiating team um, and the applicant. And I would love to go to Trustee Nicolette, who actually served on this for the last round. Yes, thank you. Uh, uh, accurate description and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, because it seems like forever ago, but then that contract came back to, it was uh, President Angie Taylor and myself, uh, who worked at the time with Anthony Hall, and then the contract came back to the board, which the board ultimately approved. And again, maybe I'm wrong, I'm human, uh, much like my dog, but I, I seem to remember we met specifically on the, what the bumpers were, as, as opposed to, what we met on this last time was more like what we're seeking in the superintendent requirements, like relocation. But I, I, I don't remember that we specifically gave guidance to the board president and vice president on the negotiations. Well, you did. So the guidance wasn't to us. The guidance was to everyone to understand what we would be negotiating and the things that we would consider. So the board didn't vote to give the guidance to the president and to the vice president. The board gave that guidance to everyone who was interested as an applicant about the things that we would consider. And that's the same way we did it before, but we've already done this. Now again, that's not to say all those things would appear in a contract, and it's not to say some new things wouldn't because it's, it's all very individual, but we have definitely gone through that process. One quick sentence. If I might, my, my recollection, for example, was incentives, work incentives, like if ACT scores improve, that kind of thing, and then we ended up not doing that. But I remember that being part of the guidance that we kind of discussed. So I'm going to vote no, but I'll, I'll let it go. Okay. 
Um, JJ, do we have any public comment? Valerie Fianaka. Welcome, Ms. Fianaka. Thank you. Hi. Didn't get a chance to chew my candy up. Um, my question is, and I know you can't answer it, but is this a time-saving measure? Um, it's certainly not saving y'all any money. We have a legal department with 11 employees, most of them attorneys, and still we require a massive amount of outside help. I would posit this should be a chore tackled by the entire board with complete transparency because this board is having a real problem with transparency at this point. Um, my second question is, have you chosen this new superintendent already? Are we at that point? Um, the organization is growing, but unfortunately student test scores are not. Tells me we have too much at the top and not enough at the bottom. We're not paying those people at the bottom enough and we don't have enough of them. So, um, so many of your responsibilities have been outsourced to staff. I'm not quite sure why we need you all anymore. Thank you, Ms. Fianaka. That's all I have for this item. All right, I'll bring it back to this board then and look for a motion to approve item 2.21. I'll move to approve, Madam Chair. Madam I'll, President. I'm sorry. I'll second, Madam President. All right, so we have a motion by Vice President Mayberry, seconded by Trustee Woodley. Seeing no lights on, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. Nay. All right, motion carries six to one. Thank you all so much. All right, that closes section two in its entirety, and now we'll move on now to section three, our finance items. And we'll go ahead and open item 3.01. This is the presentation by staff and discussion by the Board of Trustees regarding the Washoe County School District's fiscal year 2024-25 tentative budget for all district funds, a possible action to direct the interim superintendent to analyze and report back to the board specific budget issues, items, or other changes to the district's fiscal year 2024-25 budget process and approval of the fiscal year 2024-25 tentative budget. This is an item for possible action, and we welcome in front of us our Chief Financial Officer, Mark Mathers, our budget director, Jeff Bozzo. Thank you so much for being here. And um, before we jump in, just as a note to my colleagues, just as a reminder with the way that we go about these budget presentations, we'll ask questions as we go. And there may be points of decision that our board needs to make. So we would make individual decisions if we are called to and if someone would like to do that. So we will make individual specific decisions um, if that is the pleasure of the board. And then at the very end, there will be a blanket motion uh, potentially to adopt all of the changes and decisions that are made and then to send back the budget for its continued work. So this is no different than every other time. I just want to call out that there would be interim decisions. Now we'll have those discussions. We'll have the conversation. We will do public comment. And then we would come back and potentially make any of those individual decisions before a blanket motion at the end. Okay. I'm getting nods, so everyone is good, so take it away. All right, thank you, Madam President and trustees. Um, today's board meeting is a really key board meeting in the budget process um, because, as you know, our tentative budget um, is required by law to be submitted to the State Department of Taxation by April 15th. So ultimately, we are looking for your approval of the tentative budget that would include any of the changes that we'll be discussing or any changes, perhaps, that you have in addition to those. Um, uh, again, so we start um, with acknowledgement of our promise, our WCSD promise that we will know every student by name, strength, and need. And, and as we've talked before, the budget document is an expression of the priorities to support our students and families and communities. So that's always top of mind for us. Um, so today, in terms of the agenda, um, uh, thanks to the work that it's been done by staff and the deliberations and decisions by the board in January, February, and March. We're really 98 to 99% of the way there in terms of having a finalized budget. Um, so we appreciate all of the hard work the board has done. Um, this, our intention in item one will, and, and, and then also in uh, item three, notably, will be to get resolution on that final one to 2% for the tentative budget. Um, so Jeff will lead it in a discussion of item number one, which is a resolution to the preliminary deficit that we had reported to you of 1.7 million. So 
You'll remember we have a board policy that requires a structurally balanced budget, so we need to cover that shortfall of $1.7 million, and Jeff will walk you through those calculations. And then um, board policy also requires your review of any reorganizations of offices in the district and position changes. And so we will go through, Jeff will go through an agenda item number two, several reorganizations that have been proposed. Then in item three, I will go over three board requests that have come up over the last several months. We'll cover those and um, we'll provide options to you to resolve, you know, kind of your request in those three areas. I'll also cover item four, which is really just a summary of where the tentative budget stands, looking at it from a number of different angles. There's really no decisions in agenda item number four, just again reporting back to you kind of how the budget looks. And then in item number five, we do have a number of funds, more than 80 in addition to the general fund, where we need decisions and Jeff will walk you through each of the fund types and any notable changes to um, the budgets for those other funds. So a lot in front of us, we'll try to go through this efficiently for you. And with that, I'll turn it over to Jeff. Thanks, Mark. Uh, so as Mark mentioned, we uh, came to you in February with a $1.7 million preliminary general fund budget deficit. Uh, so here are the, the resolutions to resolving that deficit. Uh, the first section here is critical need cost increases. Uh, we've had, over the last couple of years, uh, increased student athletic travel cost for state championship and playoffs and also official fee increases. So that was a critical need we needed to add into the budget. Uh, we also had a board request to provide transportation to innovations, which we'll go over in more detail on a later slide. Um, but that would be fully offset by reducing one of the superintendent's operating budgets. And then also there was a need to increase the board's budget for organization and committee travel, which will also be offset by the board's, or sorry, the superintendent's budget. Uh, so the total critical needs and cost increases in addition to the 1.7 million is just over 200,000. In order to offset that deficit, uh, we have a couple of reorganizations and position changes in curriculum and instruction and school police. Again, I'll go over that shortly on a later slide. Uh, we also were able to shift bilingual clerical aids at the school site over to EL weighted funding, as that's an acceptable use of weighted funding. Uh, we rebased the communications and assessment budgets down to historical spending levels uh, so that you know aligns more with their spending and allows us to have a, a budget reduction to offset this deficit. There are also various minor budget rebasings to other departments as well. Um, and then the other changes were we had outside attorney fees for negotiations in the current fiscal year. We've wrapped up nearly all those negotiations, so we shouldn't need that budget for next year. And then also a minor weighted funding increase Um, so go, I'm confused. Increase board budget twenty thousand. That's correct. That's to help offset the additional travel cost associated with the various board committees that board members are a part of and the events they need to attend. Yes, and I'm more than happy to help with that too. So, for example, um, some of our trustees, including Trustee Church, at one point represented the board at the Nevada Association of School Boards. We actually have two representatives. We have a board of directors, and then we also have um, an executive member. Um, Trustee Woodley, for example, also represents our board in, in all of this entire area on the NIAA. Um, and we have never actually had a budget that properly provides the travel when we have to go to those meetings and actually do that. So we have individual professional development um, budgets, but we never actually properly had money earmarked for the work of the board members exclusively in service to the board and to the district, and this, this provides that. So this is not additional money for events, it's not additional money for personal professional development, it's um, exclusively around um, the service of our trustees um, to the different boards and committees that we're involved with on a state level um, um, or among different groups. 
I guess I'll comment on that. I get I get the point. When I did volunteer to serve there with the Nevada Association of School Boards, I took it out of my own $5,000 budget. I just assumed that was just the way it was because I volunteered to be on that committee. But I get the point. I'm just not sure how I how I feel about it. And then shifting down, there was one other one that I kind of was real concerned with on the bottom part. Well, go ahead. It'll come back to me. Okay. So moving on to the next slide, we also had a small revenue adjustment based on recent trends in our local revenues of $175,000. So in the summary section here, you can see the $1.7 million deficit we had in February. The critical needs increased to roughly $200,000, which gets us to a $1.9 million deficit. But then we throw in the revenue adjustment that you see above, and then also the cost reductions from the previous slide at $1.9 million, which brings us to a tentative budget with a general fund or a balanced general fund budget. I'd also like to add that's the sixth year in a row we've had a structurally balanced general fund budget. So again, I'm confused, if I might. Sorry, I confuse easily. So we went from a $1.7 to a $1.9 deficit. So it keeps going up and up. And then we're going to balance that by what now? So you're correct. We had a $1.7 million budget deficit. And in reviewing critical needs that departments had with the state athletic travel and officials fees cost, those have continued to increase. So we built that increase into the budget because it's an ongoing cost. So that brought the deficit to $1.9 million. We then have a small local revenue adjustment because we've seen an increased amount in a certain field trip revenue. So we were able to increase that by $175,000. And then on this previous slide here, the bottom section, those are all cost reductions that make up the remaining $1.7 million to resolve the $1.9 million budget deficit. And if I might, what about unfilled staff positions? Where does that filter in? So vacancy savings are one-time savings. So we do budget all the district's positions in here. But what we have done is, I believe between the general fund and the special education fund, we've budgeted $10 million between vacancy savings and turnover savings so that we're accounting for that ahead of time. Okay, so moving on to the next slide. Here's just a high level overview of the general fund budget. Again, you can see that we have a balanced general fund budget. The $62.7 million in fund balance in the tentative budget column is representative of 9.8% fund balance. Again, our target is 12%. If we were to try to get to 12%, we would need to increase fund balance by $13.8 million. So just putting that in perspective. We also have some general fund budget metrics. So again, we're below our target fund balance of 12%, but we're also below the maximum ending fund balance in state law. Anything above 16.6% can be swept by the state. We've funded our contingency account to the full 1% this year. It's at $6.3 million. And then there's also a state regulation, and this came in to be with the people-centered funding plan, where our district is limited to a 7.5% cap on central administration and general administration salary and benefits, and we're well below that cap at 6.1%. And I think that that's a really important point to just pause on, because if you're like me, you hear very regularly that we are, I mean, dramatically bloated with very high-priced administrators that are just, like, painting the toilets gold. 
Um, but this shows us that, and it's true, the cap should not be more than 7.5%. This should be an incredibly low number, appropriately so. And not only should it be an incredibly low number, but we've found a way to limbo under that incredibly low bar to 6.1%. And I just, I just wanted to bold that and put a little asterisk on it to actually, and by the way, this is the way it should be. This isn't wrong. I'm glad that we do this. Um, we should be investing most of our money into direct instruction with our students, the things that are really helping our kids. And administrators are a very important part of that. But this demonstrates that we've maintained a degree of control over the amount of money that we're spending there. And so thank you for having this number publicly out there. And I, I support it. And I'm very glad that it's even lower than what the max is. Thank you. Uh, so moving on to the general fund reorganizations and position changes, uh, the first area we have is curriculum and instruction. Uh, so this request is to delete the share coordinator position and create a teaching and learning specialist position that will focus on middle school math instruction. Um, the curriculum and instruction department is confident that those duties can be absorbed into the department and this will result in a estimated savings of approximately $75,000, which was part of our cost reductions to resolve the general fund budget deficit. Next, we have a request from school police, and this is a request to downgrade the lieutenant position to a sergeant position. So last year during the budget process, uh, you all had approved the addition of eight middle school police officers uh, dispatch position and also a lieutenant position. That lieutenant position hadn't been posted or filled yet and with uh, our new chief um, coming in and reviewing it, he believes that it's better to have a sergeant position to help with a more equal distribution of supervision and span of control among the sergeants. There's a minor savings of just over $12,000 and that was also applied to resolve the general fund budget deficit. I'll hand it back to Mark to talk about the board requests. Okay, so we had three issues that the board had brought forward before um, where staff had promised to develop options and bring those options and information back to you. Um, the first one we've talked a little bit about was to provide transportation to students at Innovations High School. Um, I think uh, we heard loud and clear that this was a you know an important equity issue. Um, so we worked with um, Mr. Scott Lee and Adam Searcy um, to um, quantify the impact to provide that transportation. They've indicated they would need three new bus drivers. So again, the plan would be for students to go to their zone school and then a bus to pick them up at their zone school to take them to Innovations High School. Um, our solution to this in consultation with our interim superintendent is to reduce the superintendent's budget. We had increased the superintendent's budget um, several years ago to provide funding for assessments of departments and other um, kind of discretionary items. And, um, you know, again, in discussing this with Dr. McNeil, we feel she felt confident that we could downsize or right size that budget by $150,000 to cover this. So this is a net zero cost neutral um, solution that we're bringing forward to you to provide again transportation to those students at Innovations High School where there are um, absenteeism issues um, and those students may not have the transportation um, provided by the family that, to, to get to that high school. So again, net impact of $0. And we're going to stay on that because there's a trustee that I'd like to recognize. Um, so just for everybody's information, all of us trustees, uh, we all represent schools. That doesn't mean those are the only schools we serve, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, but Innovations is a truly unique school, and um, I am honored to be uh, one of the trustees um, that directly supports them in addition to uh, Trustee Nicolette. But by no means does that mean that we are the only trustees that visit these schools and champion these schools. And the reason why I bring this up is because I would like to personally and publicly thank Trustee Colleen Westlake for taking up the advocacy on this item, for visiting this school, taking this school into her heart, and then championing this request for these students. And so Trustee Westlake, I'd like to turn to you. 
I'm already crying, so I just I just really want to say thank you. And thank you, Dr. McNeil, Superintendent McNeil, because not everyone has a generous heart and it's when you get something you just hang on to it and you just put blinders on to the needs of other our fellow humans and other people that we are in this community with and I really appreciate your generosity to see the need and the um, that their need was more and the sacrifice you know because I'm sure there's going to be things that you're going to have to cut back and I really appreciate it and I know the kids there are going to appreciate it and the parents there are going to appreciate it and I just want to thank the team for making it happened cost-wise. Thank you very much. And folks, this is how we do it here in the Washoe County School District on our board. Thank you so much, Trustee Westlake. I have a question on that one. Mm -hmm. How many kids are we going to be transporting, roughly? Hoping, hoping to call a friend here with, the, with Scott Lee. You get two of those. Sorry. You know if you're here. <laughs> I'm scared. Yeah, I'm on. Uh, thanks, uh, Scott Lee, Director of Transportation. For the record, we'll be transporting. There'll be um, roughly 80 students within the transport transportation zone. There's about 150 students in the school. So within three miles of the school, there are about 45 or so students. Wonderful. Yeah, I visited a number of times, and I'd like to actually see that school expand a little bit. But yeah, thank you very much. Okay, our second issue. Um, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm gonna. I apologize, uh, Trustee Westlake. Thank you. Thank you for just a, a few more minutes here, President Smith. Um, on the student body there, um, Principal Bradley had expressed um, with a passion that I literally felt that he wants that school to grow. There's a lot more of our children that could have success, but the families just, it's an impossibility to get the students to that site. So I'm sure that this is going to open up a lot of doors for a lot more children to be able to attend innovations and that problem that um, program can grow to help help these kids where it, it wouldn't be feasible without these buses it just would not be feasible thank you okay our second issue then um, that was brought forward by the board involved school police vehicles at our high schools you'll remember we added a number of um, additional uh, police officer positions last budget year and so a request was made to examine and look at um, options for efficiently providing for transportation for those new officer positions um, and actually I should clarify these are for uh, uh, officers stationed at high schools uh, not the eight new ones um, and so in consultation again with Chief Moore and, and Mr. Lee again, um, we've come up with three uh, what we think are, are fairly cost-effective options. Um, we wanted to, again, our, our difficulty here is if we bought new vehicles for those officers stationed at high schools, there's a, there's a significant uh, initial outlay and then a significant annual depreciation cost of those vehicles. So we really wanted to, again, look at cost-effective solutions um, so we came up with three options here for your consideration. Um, option A was to provide an e-bike, and these are kind of turbocharged, super-duper e-bikes. Maybe, you know, they're a little more robust and, and solid than maybe e-bikes you and I might have. Um, and, the, and the thought here is that there are areas at a school that are, you know, you can't get to with a, a police car. And so by providing an e-bike, um, those officers could get to uh, ball fields and other areas at a school 
um, and also conceivably nearby schools. Um, and so this was an option, again, developed um, by Chief Moore as a, you know, a way to, again, um, give those officers an ability to reach areas of the school quickly. Um, option B was um, rather than procure brand new vehicles would be ahead of the end of the useful life of police vehicles to repurpose those used vehicles um, and place them at the school site. And so the vehicle would stay on the campus. Um, we're piloting this approach right now, I understand. Um, but that would accelerate somewhat the acquisition of vehicles. So there would be a minor cost of repurposing these maybe a year or two earlier than, than they otherwise would be uh, sold. But uh, again, a very minimal cost here to provide those vehicles to be, again, stationed at the school available for use of those officers who are stationed at that high school to respond to other schools when there's an emergency. So again, this is provides a little higher level of service than option A, if you will, um, to respond to other schools. So they, each of these officers stationed at high school would have a vehicle to go to a, a nearby school in, a, in an emergency. Um, we've estimated that cost. And so, I should have also said for each of these options, we're also supplying gun safes at each high school. So you see there a cost of $12,000, that's related to the gun safes. We really, other than minor maintenance costs and fueling costs, there really is no cost to repurpose those used vehicles under option B. And then option C is a hybrid program. Again, this was developed in consultation with Chief Moore, who's here to answer any questions. Um, but for those eight new officer positions you approved last year, we're in the process of acquiring vehicles. We could deploy them to the officers stationed at the high schools for the moment while we recruit and fill those eight new positions. And then once those positions are filled, again, we provide an e-bike. So kind of a midway solution, if you will, between options A and B. Um, but again, Chief Moore largely is the author of these options, um, kind of new set of eyes, new ideas that he brought to the table. So if you have questions, I would invite Chief Moore to come up to respond. Um, and just as a signal to my colleagues, you know, we're asking questions, we're talking now. This is an example after public comment that we're going to need to come back to and, and make a decision. So when I was talking about those individual decisions, <coughs> this is one of them. Now, obviously, we could go in a totally different direction, but this is an example of a decision we're going to have to make. Um, Trustee Westlake, since this item actually came from Clerk Rodriguez, I'd like to defer to him first, um, and he can lead the way. Oh, thank you, Madam President. Actually, um, kind of on this topic, uh, if we can actually go back and look at the lieutenant position that uh, was being proposed to be downgraded to a sergeant, uh, I think it's like 12. Um, but, uh, so my understanding with our police department, it's about 47 sworn fully staffed and roughly about 60-ish for um, total staff. When, when this you know, when the board made it, voted on this, it was it was evident that it was going to be needed um, to keep that succession planning. Uh, frankly, I'll be honest, as a department of that size, I can't see just having two administrators. I think that lieutenant position is a very key position, where it goes from field supervisor learning to be an administrator. Uh, so, I, I, but uh, I guess. Um, I'm really hesitant to get rid of that position. Um, is there any? Sorry, Chief Moore, Washington School Police for the record. Uh, President Smith, Superintendent McNeil, and trustees, I appreciate your, your concerns there, Trustee Rodriguez. <clears throat> Coming in, I'm still in that analytical phase as your Chief of Police trying to make sure that we're applying these resources in an effective way. <laughs> One thing I, I completely agree with is providing that school police officer coverage in the middle school areas. Um, one concern that I had with was that position was that span of control. Um, I know a lieutenant makes an administrative position. There are other options, trust me. We're looking at all options we can here. What I'm trying to do is fill the immediate need. Um, 
that supervisor ratio in public safety, an ideal model is five to seven. Some agencies are four to six. Uh, we're pushing that threshold right now. And our current staffing model, and I can, I apologize, I left it at my desk. I can bring copies for you all on these proposed models or email them to uh, JJ. But eight positions would require a supervisor in the field. That's my primary concern. The sergeants in their current existing model are sitting at a ratio of 10, some 12, 14, depends on what duties you take, wow. but realigning that structure. So I certainly agree. Yes, we need patrol officers in middle school. Some of these middle schools have higher uh, enrollment numbers than some high school campuses we do. We can pull crime stats and, and substantiate th those, those causes. But uh, I certainly believe that yes, we do need to create a higher administrative structure. But the immediate need is to get the field supervisory positions filled. And I have an ideal model that I will address to this board as we continue through in budget planning for the next one, but uh, I get it and I'm definitely here for your questions. No, so with that being said, now, because I, I do work in this career field, um, and um, you're not wrong, like having X amount of officers, a sergeant, you know, for 10 or 12 officers, that is preposterous, really. Um, so can, can we explore looking at maybe Instead of getting rid, taking the easy answer, in my opinion, and getting rid of the position, how about we make one of those officer positions a sergeant then? I mean, I kind of leave that to staff or, to, you know, my colleagues. I mean, because, I mean, having that, how many, what was it, how many officers do you have, like, officers? Like, As a total department, we're near 60. Uh, officers were pushing uh, close to I have to look at that new number, some right. other positions I'm, I, I've, I've allocated some resources to, so we have to do some shuffling. Right. But uh, we're sitting nearly 50. Wow. I'm gonna, die. I'm gonna digest that for a minute. We'll keep you up here, Chief Moore, in case there's more questions. Um, yeah, but first I'm gonna go to Trustee Westlake and then I'll go to Trustee Church, thank you. Thank you, President Smith. So I, I'm just trying to recollect, I think when this first came up, I had asked for an officer at every middle school. I think that's what happened and we just thought that was not gonna be cost effective. And so I was going down in flames with it, but then Trustee Rodriguez said, well, let's hire eight and then have them placed where, is that, the right recollection placed in a position where it's needed. So honestly, if, if we need the lieutenant position, I mean, it, it was kind of where the, the need, it was phrased where the need was the greatest. So I just, I wanted to remind everybody about that. And then I just wanted to say that I like that hybrid because not every location is going to need the same specific tools. Every location could be different. And with the hybrid, maybe a car would be a better thing to place at the school and maybe at another location, the e-bikes. So I just wanted to say that, you know, having options out there is good because our schools are all different, but they're like little, little worlds in and of themselves, little communities. So I like the, the, um, flexibility in that option C. And then my only other concern, and Chief Morris, maybe you can um, answer this. So the gun safes, is there a way to get ones that are fingerprint or hand print activated to open or lock? Because those little keys can get going everywhere in which way, and I would hate us to lose those keys to a gun safe at a school site. So that was just a concern I had. Thank you. And I can certainly answer your question. Um, let me give you a little bit of history on the purpose of the gun safe. <clears throat> the ideal weapon we like to use in law enforcement is a rifle. Uh, it is has its reasons, I won't get into great details, but we don't have the ability to keep that in close proximity to the officer. Patrol cars provide that, but our officers are primarily inside that campus. Patrol cars, exterior, it's restricted movement. I'm, we can, you, I'm here to answer your questions and get that clarified for you all so you make an educated decision. That was a gap we're having. 
the car was to provide that long gun storage. Our field testing proved that was not an effective application or storage of the device. It's secure, don't get wrong. Going back to your safe, yes, we do have, uh, those will be secured, bolted to the floor. They will not be, I mean, I'm sure anyway can find a way out, but they can take ATM machines. Uh, it will be secured, bolted to the floor. It will have uh, a multiple levels of security in it. We can go with the key code system. We can go with the fingerprint system. I still caution, electronics sometimes fails. Uh, they will have a keyed system. We will definitely do our security and policies, procedures for those keys, who's owning those, but we'll, yes, that's, uh, we will have all those security measures in place. Trustee Church. Without going into uh, detail, I support the idea of gun safes, uh, Chief Moore. The other thing, I, I have two concerns. Number one, I don't think we should be micromanaging. How many cars, whatever. I'd prefer just to say, look, here's your budget, live with it. It's up to you. We trust your judgment. That's why we hired you, and I do trust your judgment. So I'm really not comfortable having us micromanage this unless for some legal reason we have to. But I will opine as a former police supervisor what's not on there. Uh, on the e-bikes, whether it's a bicycle, e-bike, or motorcycle, that requires extra training, how you ride the bike, where you ride the bike, helmets, et cetera. But I'll tell you this, from my experience, and I'm just firm on this, the first time you have an accident, and it's gonna happen, and an officer is, breaks a leg, gets a head injury, helmet or not, um, it's not worth the cost. I am just not a proponent because bicycles get hit. People don't see them, you run into a curb, you don't see it, not, I mean, there's a million reasons, but bikes, electric or not, cause accidents, cause injuries that you don't have with a normal car. You know, I'd rather see a golf cart personally, but I, I just want to put that on the record to me that I, as a police supervisor from the past days, I just can't support that in my mind because of the potential injury. We don't want officers injured or killed. And I know we have police motorcycles. I know we, some agencies have horses, whatever it is, but it just increases the, uh, the danger there. But I think the bottom line for what I'm trying to say is I don't want to micromanage. If we don't have to, I don't want to. I'd rather just let you make, make the decision of how you want to run your department within the budget. Um, before we move on from this, um, Clerk Rodriguez, did you have any more questions or thoughts? Because I want to make sure we, we stay on this. We ask the questions so that when we can come back after public comment, uh, yeah. We can consider items. Yeah, no, I'm good for now. Uh, we can continue on and just be thinking in my head a little bit. Thank you. Okay, I have a question before you run away. Um, I don't do this line of work, uh, so I am very interested in the experience of our chief and then um, of our board members that have experience with this. I know you came up with all three. Which one do you want? The most. I would probably go with the recommendation of option C. Reason being is we can repurpose these vehicles. There are certain campuses that a patrol vehicle is very viable to response in the community, and there's some campuses where patrol cars just not effective. Um, some of the feedback we have gotten from these test hybrids are traffic. I can jump on my e-bike and be anywhere. All the officers currently have bikes, but is the amount of energy you exert by the time you get to the call, you're pretty exhausted. I could tell you I served on a campus in the district and I would ride my bike all the way down to that campus and I would stand outside the doors and catch my breath before I went in there. I knew it was on a full on, you know, struggle with the, trying to gain control of a student. Uh, the e-bike allows us to get there quicker, uh, in my opinion, safer, because one time I stepped off the bike being exhausted and scraped myself up. We're trying to use technology to our advantage. We're trying to think smarter, not harder. So I would support the e-bikes, the gun safes, and I want y'all to make an informed decision. The officers are in their office. They need that safe for the long gun, for the effective tool for the job. The e-bike is kept in the office. When they're called for service, they're readily able to jump on that bike and deploy to the scene far more uh, effective and efficient. Patrol cars, yes, we do need them. Uh, our, our survey testing right now is traffic. It is, is a great struggle. 
Um, if we were to get to this model of hybrid sea where we're fully staffed, we have middle school patrol, we are going to have more of a patrol visibility on those high school campuses because those patrol options are bouncing back and forth. Middle schools are, uh, are a key component that I commend you all for investing in. That is a critical component. These middle schools are, are big enrollment numbers. There's no different than a high school. A student is a student. Um, I prefer that option C. If I had my choice and we go to the other side, I'd prefer another hybrid model I have in there too, and that is the position of a lieutenant. That is an additional position of a sergeant. Uh, we have grown, but we haven't built that solid foundation. Like I say, my concern for this district is always going to be that patrol operations. Everything from middle school up, you know what, that's for my administrative team to figure that out. If I don't staff a high school or middle school campus, then I'm not doing our primary function. So I hope it helps you all. All right, thank you. Um, Trustee Westlake, do you have another question? And then I, we're going to move on to the next session. I do. Thank okay. you, President Smith. Again, uh, for Chief Moore, thank you. Um, on the, um, you, I just heard you say that the officers already have bikes. So can you, do? is there a history of a lot of injuries or, God forbid, a, a death? I mean, is, is, is that something to really be concerned with that Trustee Church mentioned because if they if we have bikes out there there should be some kind of data that we know is going on with the a bike which i don't an e-bike is just like a bike except you're not expending the energy thank you so yes thank you again uh all of our officers are required and that's part of the training process is to do the uh, police mountain bike patrol class we actually are the instructors throughout the community for all law enforcement, UNR police, Reno police, they come to our, we have the instructors, we teach the course. So it's a requirement of the job to ride a bike. Um, I hope that answers, now when it comes to injuries, any line of this work is gonna have injuries, either on the bike or uh, controlling a situation. I would say that there is no flag that I have seen from bike injuries that would cause me to be alarmed. If it was, we would probably just eliminate it. But uh, is an effective means of transportation on the campus? Um, does it put a higher risk? It most certainly does, but I don't believe we have any current data to show that is a, a risk uh, or an increased cost to the district. Thank you so much, Chief Moore. Okay, our last issue that was brought up by the board concerned athletic directors, and I know there's been a fair amount of conversation back and forth um, between schools, um, our Office of Teaching Learning Leadership. Um, uh, what we, what what TLL did, what um, our lead associate chief did was to reach out to schools to understand what are actually schools doing in terms of um, providing athletic directors at our schools. Because um, I, I, and it, I think as it turns out, there's been a fair amount of misinformation here. So hopefully this does clear it up. I, I, I hope so. Um, so what this table shows, again, based on the research of our associate chiefs, was that for all but four schools, they essentially have already converted a teacher position to become a full-time athletic director. So I think you've heard complaints about athletic directors being pulled in different directions and teaching half-time and, and serving as athletic director half-time and how that's not viable. Um, what the research done by TLL shows is, again, with the exception of four schools, those schools do have full-time athletic directors currently. So they've gone ahead and converted a certified position to be an athletic director position. Um, you see Galena High School uh, their athletic director covers two online classes. McQueen, their athletic director, uh, teaches two PE classes. Sparks High School, the athletic director teaches three PE classes. And then at Reno High, this does appear to be a situation where it's kind of half and half. They cover, uh, or, or, or maybe slanted towards teaching, they cover four classes, English, Math, Science, and Social Studies. So. Um, those are the facts as collected by our associate chiefs about what's happening on the ground at our schools. Um, you'll recall that 
we actually looked at funding new athletic director positions several years ago, and that had a cost of $1.1 million. And at that time, you know, the board just had to pass on that as much as as much as as we all recognize that's an important priority that that cost just wasn't fundable at the time and so this appears to be how schools have kind of reacted over time um, to covering athletic director positions um, to the point again where seven of the 11 high schools do actually have a full-time athletic director they just converted it from a teaching position and it's not a separate classification of athletic director so to clarify it, we don't have that in the district, but they are performing the athletic director role at those seven schools. So I'll stop there and hopefully we can answer any questions you have. Thank you. Um, as our NIAA rep, I'd like Trustee Woodley to lead us off with this, um, followed by Trustee Nicola and Vice President Mayberry. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I have to, uh, two questions. Um, first off, um, with Regards to the four identified schools that have um, athletic directors with other responsibilities, um, is it safe to say that the principals of these schools um, are open or have the ability to change their schedule or work maybe through the next budget year or through some process to um, be able to join the other remaining high schools where we have all the zeros? And then my second question is, um, Athletic director, just as the title itself, is that equivalent to a teacher? Um, when I see the word director, I don't know, because you said that they have been, for lack of a better term, they've been um, replaced by a teacher's position. So I just wasn't sure if they do equate those two positions, because when I see the title athletic director, I don't know how that if that yeah. is, in fact, um, one by one the same as the teacher. Is that something we should consider? Thank you. So um, I'm going to have uh, our lead uh, associate chief, Tiffany McMaster, come up and help explain that, how allocations are adjusted within the high school level, because I think she'll be able to kind of articulate that. And while she's, while she's coming up here, um, I think there was a edict last year that was put out um, to where schools could not convert um, a position um, because what was happening is that the schools would convert the position and then our classroom sizes would get larger. And so there was a decision that was made so that you couldn't do both. Um, and so what we're considering is to allow the high schools to have that flexibility so that they would be able to convert that position just knowing that their classroom sizes may, you know, have to be adjusted as well, too. Yeah. Good afternoon, Tiffany McMaster, Associate Chief, for the record. If I could just have you repeat the question. Okay. So uh, my first question was um, in regards, and I think um, Dr. McNeil uh, already alluded to the response, with regards to those um, athletic directors that have other responsibilities, do the, do the principals have the ability to um, change that or modify that as necessary? Um, or is it something that they need to do or consider in their next budget cycle if they do want to do that? And then the second question was, um, are they apples for apples if you convert a teacher to an athletic director? Okay, so to address the first question, um, the to take the existing courses that are being taught by the athletic directors and um, not teach those courses is really a function of a master scheduling committee and so it's not a really easy answer. It's specific to each school site, depends on their course demands. Um, every school is, is unique. So for some schools it may be easier than others. Um, for some schools you have a lot of um, individual requests. You know, you have one AP chemistry course and one leadership course and one photography class and those little singletons in order to offer those things impact your master schedule and make it difficult to offer um, other things and so um, you would need to look at the master schedule in its entirety to answer that. Um, and then the second part of the question, um, if I could get a little more clarification. 
So my understanding is that the athletic director is equivalent to a teacher. Correct. So that's my question. Is it in fact equivalent to a teacher or should we be looking in the future at creating athletic directors as its own position separate from that? So we didn't just say, hey, yeah. we're going to just transfer you over here and it's not really the same duties or qualifications or responsibilities. At some point, are we going to look at, okay, we're going to actually create an allocation for athletic directors and not just say, hey, math teacher, Spanish teacher, we're sure. just going to make you the athletic director. I understand. Um, well, to answer just the, the initial part of that, every athletic director currently in our district does have a teacher certification license. Um, and, you know, a lot of that is just understanding the complexities of teaching. Um, a lot of the duties involve things like going into independent campus, pulling grades for um, eligibility and those kinds of things. So many of the functions are things that teachers have the capacity to do. Let me just help out a little bit here. So it's not mutually exclusive then. What, what I, I think what Trustee Rodriguez, is, or excuse me, <laughs> what Lee is, is getting to. Um, in other words, if I'm teaching chemistry for six sessions, six mm -hmm. sections, then I could also possibly be an athletic director, but I can't do both at the same time. Correct. Right. Yes. And so as the principal or the, or the assistant principal over curriculum and the master schedule, I can convert one of my teacher allocations to that full-time athletic director, but then I need to find those other classes through the master scheduling. Correct. Right. Okay. Correct. I'm a little out of my expertise here, aside from the teacher position. So are athletic directors or someone coaching especially at the high school, um, it, it's, it's a different kind of teaching, um, absolutely. Certainly working in infinite campus is something that we can train professionals to do. Athletic directors have very unique schedules. And, and I actually agree with my colleague Alex Woodley because um, although a, a coach is a type of teacher, they, they are in a position of their own, I believe. And I really think that we should look at, in the future, um, we're right now talking about the now, we should look at an athletic director position because there are so many, and I've been looking into this because this has been a discussion for quite some time, as I know you have too. Um, they're very different kind of work. And... Um, they are uh, sometimes 11 and 11 and a half months of work with the, the training, et cetera, and depending on the, on the, the sports. It's, it's a different kind of work, and I am going to strongly suggest that in the future, near future, we really look at this as a unique position in and of its own um, and somehow put it on the, the uh, position pay scale and work scale. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, a couple, just some some thoughts, and then and then a question. I'll get to it. But I, yeah, th this is sort of an incredibly frustrating, you know, discussion to have because I, I have heard uh, a lot, and then I see this slide and it almost contradicts what I heard. So to your point, I don't know if it's just two different perspectives or some misinformation. I can tell you in one instance, and I, I'm not going to name the schools because I don't want to. Um, I don't want to put anybody in a difficult position, but certainly you know, Clerk Rodriguez and I had a meeting with the principal uh, a few months ago, uh, had an email recently just pleading for an athletic director. Um, we've had uh, multiple um, emails d d directed to the board uh, wanting um, athletic directors, but yet I look at this this slide and it's, it's telling me that in, in, in some cases, some of these principals, they're the athletic so-called athletic directors uh, are not teaching. So, uh, you know, I, from my perspective, I, I really think going forward at some point, we really need to have a hard discussion and, and having uh, ADs, you know, be solely ADs. And I'm wondering, is it, it would it cost any money to reclassify 
uh, in a D position today. I know that Alex, uh, Trustee Woodley, uh, you did brought that up, but just asking the question more directly, you know, would it cost money to, to allocate in a D uh, position beyond what a teacher does since they do work more than 187 days out of the week? Does, does that make sense? Um, I believe so. I mean, you're, you're talking about allocating an additional person to fulfill those uh, yeah, responsibilities. Uh, uh, so I, I do, yes. I guess I would say if the proposal would be to reduce the number of teacher allocations at the school by one, no. and, well, if you're going to create new athletic directors at every school, again, we go back to the cost of $1.1 $1 .1 million. $1.1 1 million, yeah, and, and that's clearly not sustainable and, right, right now. Right. It's not. Um, if you were to essentially create a new athletic director position to reflect Okay. What apparently de facto is happening at schools, at yes. least seven schools, I think there are a couple human resources issues. One is, is that position a certified position or not? And so that okay. would have to be addressed and answered. And then secondly, I think you raised a question, or, or maybe it was Dr. Nicolai who raised the question, or maybe Trustee Woodley. I don't, I don't remember, maybe all of you did, whether this position would be a nine-month position, 10-month, 11-month, 12-month position. And so that's another issue or consideration or question, I think, that would have to be looked into. And then a proposal brought back to the board with, again, a new formal athletic director classification. Mm -hmm. So there would be, ne I think there would need to be work done in each of those areas to kind of address those questions and maybe survey other districts. And I've seen some surveys recently on this issue from another district, ironically, but I think if, if the direction of the board is to look into this and come back maybe next year with a, propo a solid proposal to settle this, I think those are, are some of the issues that would need to be addressed. I appreciate that. I, I think just from what I hear too, fundamentally, I think the, there's a fundamental consensus that an, an athletic director should be a stand-alone position at our high schools, particularly given that we're embracing the strategic plan and in encouraging our students, you know, on the athletic and, and club side and in, in the intramural side. So I, I know it's, it's a hard discussion to have, and I appreciate it. It's been on my mind. And, again, we, I, I hope some of these folks that have emailed us are listening. You know, I've had uh, athletic directors themselves reached out. Uh, some have suggested that, you know, we're, we don't uh, – we, we want to get rid of athletics, which is it's not the case at all. Uh, I, I, I understand. I, I appreciate the conversation. And I'll just add uh, something, Vice President Mayberry. Um, in the future, I think it would be really important to also have a meet and confer with our associations because, to Mr. Mather's point, we're not quite sure if this is going to be quasi-administrative, such as our deans are. Our deans are not administrators, as they are in other counties. They're quasi-administrators, um, but they allow us to build our pipeline of administrators. Um, so it could be a certified position, it could be an administrative position, and once we go into that realm, then we're going to be talking about CBAs because whose unit do they belong under? And so that's something that needs to be discussed and figured out. Thank you, President Smith. So I'm, I'm looking at the chart, and I know it's been the top priority of the board and really the community that our, our teachers are compensated. So I'm looking at this more on a compensation. So maybe if you could help me understand. So let's just take Reno High. So are they, is there any additional compensation when they're taking on a teaching role to teach English and then they're also having to do the duties of an athletic director. And I, I just want to say that the teaching probably is taking up a lot of uh, planning for instruction, but an athletic director is really having to juggle and oversee, he's overseeing all the athletics. So is, if they're not being additionally compensated, can we get a price tag on what it would look like to compensate the ones that are trying to wear two hats and fulfill two positions? 
So I don't believe there's any provision or allowance for additional compensation for someone who's doing split duties like that. Um, to answer that, to answer that question, um, and again, we're we're in deep into CBA territory now, so I hesitate to really give any specifics about an interim solution. I hear you loud and clear. I hear the rest of the board loud and clear that that you want us to look at this um, and maybe just reflect reality, but consider again a separate classification for athletic director. I, I do I hear that, um, but I don't want to misstate or misstep by commenting too too much further about CBA issues. Yeah, and then I also want to add to that because of where we are in the, the budgetary process on a few levels. I am also very personally um, interested in this. These are the kind of signaling that we can do as we build other budgets um, and as we build, I mean, many of the things that we've accomplished in this budget are things that we brought up a couple years ago, okay, so there's there's steps. Later on in the presentation, we'll also see that overall in this budget, we've uh, created and stabilized funding for over 240 new positions in this district. So it's a matter of you know what we're able to get to in this budget and then the things that we know we want to build towards. I will also point out, and by the way, we can do anything we want, but we are absolutely at the point where to add things also means taking things away, and that's completely our responsibility. And by no means to anyone who's out there, I am not trying to position athletic directors as worth more or less anything. It's just there's a certain budgetary reality. We completely control that, but I just need to make that clear. But again, things that we've accomplished this budgetary year were things that have taken some time and this is something that we can set some intentionality around in terms of recognizing. So I'll just put that out there. Um, and then I'll go to Clerk Rodriguez, and then maybe we can move on to the next item. Yeah, I just want to you know, um, put out there that to my colleagues, I, I echo. Uh, I do, I would like to see this explored. Um, you know, I, I, I feel for some of these uh, athletics directors, you know, they're working till like six, seven o'clock football practice and turn around and, you know, getting ready to teach class at, you know, 7.30 in the morning. So it's pretty rough for some of those out there. Um, but yeah, and thank you. I, I'm, I'm going off the athletic director if I can real quick. Just, I, I got just one uh, follow up. We, and, and just quick tight response. I know we have a lot to cover. Uh, fingerprinting, remember we talked about fingerprinting? It, what, what it, whatever happened, what was the outcome of that? I mean, that was so low such a low-hanging fruit item, I, di I didn't see it. Yeah, I, the quick answer is I think that needs further analysis and it didn't rise to the level of other priorities in this strategic planning budgeting process. Oh, you're killing me, Smalls, okay. We, we did for some um, team members, right, that earn within a certain amount or no? That, that was informally proposed at a prior a board meeting and it was okay. never enacted. There will always be more things. <laughs> okay, um, moving on to the next section. Again, these are just what, what we heard from the board is they would like to see some different summaries from different angles on what has been approved and what is included in the tentative budget that is before you for approval. And I thought that was a great idea. And as, as uh, President Smith uh, just, just indicated, what you approved uh, was a total of a little over $25 million of general, additional general fund and weighted funding resources to support, support our students and schools. And that does equate to 242 and a half positions, which is incredible. That's some huge factor over what we've ever been able to do before. I'm going to speed through this, but these are really important. I know yes. you're going to speed through this, but for anyone who's watching this meeting from our journalism partners or the community, yeah. that's a headline, folks. Yeah. Okay? I'm going to pause on that. We hear, and I believe, and as you very much hear reflected from this board, people over programs, adding and stabilizing funding for over 240 positions in service to our children is a very serious, significant um, note, and I would ask anyone that's reporting on this or being aware of this, that this is walking the talk of yeah. valuing the people that are in service to our children and families. And so I just, I wanted to put an exclamation point on that because if I'm not mistaken, this is 
absolutely unprecedented, and I just don't mean here in Washoe County. I mean the state. So I, I'm really, really proud of uh, this board and our admin team and all the staff members that made that happen. But these dollars are people in service to our children. Yep, absolutely. And so um, this, this slide just summarizes how we, again, deploy those dollars across the five different goals of the strategic plan. The next slide talks about, again, we talked about in January major themes, and this just shows you how that is broken out by those themes. Um, you can see we one of the themes there at the bottom was to stabilize funding of the 242 positions that 107 and a half of them um, fall into that category. And so here's a further breakout again of those 242 and a half positions um, between new positions that were created, again, an astounding number of 135, and then positions that would have been deleted because they were funded by ESSER uh, or other federal programs that, that are ending this year, or uh, an additional 79 positions that have been, again, cobbled together from various funding sources, and now we're stabilizing those positions so those people know they have a job from year to year. So really phenomenal change um, that has been made. Yeah. Again, just further, um, further tables for your information, going back to people over programs. You can see this is heavily weighted towards salaries and benefits of positions. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, President Smith. I just want to say there is another headline because, um, oh gosh, this is such a deep dive look. And, and when I see the general fund at $10 million, I mean, that is to the penny. <laughs> and the work that, the, the behind the scenes work to get to this point, um, to honor our strategic plan, to, to provide the resources, the listening, the asking that, that went into this so that we could provide the resources to really make our plan realize its, its um, integrity, its possibilities. I am just so proud of the work and, and uh, two of you sit in front of us, thank you for that, but I know that there are, I would bet there's hundreds of voices that are involved in this, this process and I thank everyone for that. I think you're right. I mean, I, I know the executive team put in many, many hours and their teams behind them put many, many hours and we were, coming out of some uncertainty, right? Some instability. And so that we got together very quickly and met quite regularly um, to develop the plan. And I'm, I'm proud too. So thank you for the comments. Yeah. <laughs> um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Bazo to bring it on home and talk about other funds. But these are important, even though we call them other funds, they're still very important. Thanks, Mark. Uh, <laughs> uh, so the first group of, <laughs> of the other funds are special revenue funds. So these are special education fund weighted funding sources and other grant funding sources. Um, our, our revenues in these are in line with what we'll get for grant funding revenue or the weighted or special education funding revenue. Uh, one issue we did have regarding at-risk funding um, so during the last legislative session, the funding bill said we were going to get approximately $6.2 million in at-risk funding for um, fiscal year 24-25, so the fiscal year coming up. Uh, however, those funding amounts get adjusted based on our student counts on the October count day or validation day that the state does. And according to the state's numbers, we had um, about or 1,765 less at-risk students, and therefore our funding was reduced accordingly. Um, so instead of the $16.2 million in at-risk funding, we will get $10.4 million in at-risk funding. Um, there's other issues with at-risk funding and concerns that the Commission on School Funding is looking at and hopefully will make some recommendations before the next legislative session uh, to help improve the stability of this funding from year to year. Fortunately, uh, we do have savings in the current fiscal year in the at-risk fund that will roll over to 
next year's budget to offset that $5.8 million dollars um, or the $5.8 million shortfall and then we'll continue to monitor this as we get into budgeting for the fiscal year 25-26 year in the next legislative session. Thank you. I think it's extremely important to point out that this was a journey of discovery trying to figure out what at risk was going to meet to be and and I believe that we took some risks in utilizing the money in places that that were very important and now we find out that somewhere in the ethos uh, they've come up they the Department of Education the, the the whomever come up with this number that it's like where did you get that number and I really appreciate in the information that we've received that you are going to continue to vet trying to understand what at risk means because it's not clear and I think it is evolving and I know that um, our other our friends in the other districts throughout Nevada are feeling the same way they don't know really it kind of stymies you in moving forward and planning um, when you find out that well gosh I guess they're telling us we don't have what we thought we had yeah, and just to add on real quickly, we received last week some follow-up information from the Department of Education. So first, I think as we share, this is an AI-generated calculation, literally. This is uh, not something you can uh, de uh, disaggregate and discover why a child might be considered at risk or not. It's a uh, it's a very complicated, again, AI-generated calculation. I'm not joking around. It truly is. Um, and um, what the information we recently received from NDE shows is that we were successful, that we actually brought, a, you know, a third of formerly at-risk students and, and brought the, their scores up so that they're no longer considered at risk, but then we're penalized because we did a good job. And that's not how you want to incentivize funding, right? So I know the Commission on School Funding is concerned there is a consensus to strongly look at this and make recommendations to change how this funding is allocated. I, I, I'm absolutely, we may not have a consensus on a solution yet, but there's a consensus that there is a problem that needs to be fixed. Thank you, President Smith. I, I just wanna add to that um, what you just said, um, Mr. Mathers. You work so hard to bring an at-risk child up to a certain level and then it's like they think everything is great. Well, everything around that child that affects that child is still there. Nothing was done to improve, decrease or increase the effects of things outside of what is going on in the classroom. So th removing funding from an at-risk child just because they are starting to improve, it, it's, it's, to me it's just, it's horrible because we can't change the outside effects. So we're doing the best we can inside the classrooms and we have to keep doing that because the things on the outside aren't changing for that child. Thank you so much for that. All right, I think we're gonna continue and then we'll finish up and then we'll go to public comment, okay? Okay, uh, so moving on to our internal service funds. So we have um, our property and casualty fund, which is our you know, risk management program. Uh, we're anticipating between that and our workers' compensation fund about a 20% rate increase, which is consistent what we've had over the last several years. And then our health insurance fund, we've budgeted an 8% increase to rates in that fund. Um, there is a position request on this slide here, and this is for the property and casualty or risk management program um, to have a, an additional or one full-time uh, clerk position to help with processing claims and other claims activity related functions in that department. When risk management moved over to the business office, um, there was no clerical support that was shifted over, but there was clerical support in the previous department, and the cost of that new position would be approximately $60,000.
in our capital projects funds, uh, you can see the, the various capital projects funds here. Uh, there are two new bond issuance included for next year's budget, uh, rollover bond at $150 million or less, and a WC1 bond issuance of $75 million or less. These are currently in the capital improvement plan, which I believe is being reviewed by the Capital Funding Protection Committee this week. So if there are any adjustments to the district's capital improvement plan, we will adjust that prior to the final budget. So any of those adjustments are completed in the final budget you'll see in May. There's also um, a request for five new positions in the capital projects program. Um, so the planning group director, the planning group project manager, there's two of those positions, and the lead project coordinator position. Those positions are uh, direct support for the capital projects department um, to be, or to help support the FMP or facilities modernization plan and other facilities projects in the upcoming years. And then there's also a purchasing position, an assistant director of procurement position being proposed. This position would support uh, capital, um, capital project buying and managing of those projects, buy list, capital renewal program, and other things associated with just capital projects. Next, we have our debt service fund. Uh, this accounts for paying back the, the debt or principal and interest payments on our long-term and medium-term debt, so our capital projects uh, issuances. The payments for those proposed bonds are included in here as well. Next, we have our enterprise fund or our nutrition services fund. Uh, if you recall, back in February, you all approved to expand the CEP or community eligibility program um, ISP percentage to 35%, which will uh, increase the amount of free meals to approximately 2,700 students for the upcoming school year. Thank you. I've, I've been wondering about the shift in the enterprise fund and from free and reduced lo free lunches for everyone, et cetera and how then we shifted to trying to help more families and students. Um, what will that mean for our nutrition, nutrition services department as far as, as balancing coming, uh, having, uh, will they have more to do, less to do? I, I don't know how to think about it. Um. Yeah, really, and, and, and Mr. Searcy is here and can speak to this in more depth, but there's a serious, significant operational change to go back to uh, meals for, you know, for non-FRL students to have to pay. And so I know I've spoken to Mr. Searcy. He's all over it, um, but it is a significant change to start charging again for meals at the food line. There will need to be training and retraining of staff. There will need to be education to our families. Um, again, non-FRL students not at non-CEP schools to understand you've got to pay for your kids' meals now. Um, and so it's, it's a huge shift. Again, Adam's all over it. Um, we've been working with Aramark to kind of line that all out. We're meeting monthly about it. So it, 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 thank you for noting it. It's a big change, and, and it's not talked about much, but it is a big change. Thank you, and I see someone very important in the audience who's, I'm sure, going to be all on that communication. <laughs> that would be Miss Anderson. Uh, so moving on, a summary of all of our funds, including the other funds. Uh, our total district's budget for FY25 is uh, just short of $1.3 billion. Uh, our FTEs are so full-time equivalents of positions across the entire district for the upcoming school year are just over 7,300 FTEs and that includes all the 242 positions you approved earlier in this budget process. Uh, and then real quick, timeline and next steps. Uh, whatever is approved today, we'll begin implementing that. Um, for the upcoming hiring period and our next meeting to discuss the budget is on May 28th. We'll have a quick hearing on the tentative budget and then also a presentation on the final budget. 
All right. On that note, thank you so much for that. Let's go ahead and go to public comment, and then we'll bring it back for if there are any um, individual decisions and then um, a blanket decision at that point. Valerie Fianaka. Welcome again, Ms. Fianaka. Valerie Fianaka, for the record. Um, I don't know if any of you did the calculations while we were going through that, but um, the, pri the prior agenda, consent agenda, you approved $5,594,434 in one consent agenda vote. That's alarming to me. I know it's expedient for y'all, but um, the public needs to know, the people who aren't here in, in person, how much you typically vote on on consent agenda without breaking it down for individual votes especially in an election year. Um, and yet you're in the hole by 1.9 million, maybe. I'm not quite sure on that. Or maybe you dug it out, yourselves out, with vacancy and turnover savings and special ed. And here, I wasn't gonna speak on this, but here you touched a nerve with me because I have a 10-year-old special needs grandson who's been to three different schools in two years because of turnover, because of incompetent teachers who really weren't teachers. They might, they, some of them were babysitters, actually. Um, but now he's gone to the same school that your children go to, Miss Smith. So I'm hoping that since he's going to a rich school, things are going to work out better for him. He's going to the richest school in this district. Um, I have a real problem with that. Um, I, I just wanted to point out to the public who aren't here in person how much we spend on one vote. Thank you, Ms. Fianaka. Kaylin Evans. Welcome, President Evans. Hi, thank you um, all so much. Uh, Kaylin Evans, President of the Washoe Education Association. Um, you know, just wanted to also kind of piggyback on some of the things that were said. And first and foremost, that this budget does clearly show a priority over personnel. And we thank you for that. We thank for the work of the budget office and the administrative team and really focusing on that area. And we know that that has been a major priority for this board and that it shows. Um, and, and the reason that we always preach that about the people over programs is because we know that that has the, the strongest and most profound impact on our students. Um, so thank you. Uh, you know, I just wanted to touch on the AD positions because those guys are in our unit. Um, they are a very small, uh, they're a small group, but they are absolutely essential for athletics at the high school level. Athletics in high school do not exist without the athletic director positions. Um, at, at the bare minimum, we really need to be talking about reclassifying that allocation because that is the truth, that there are some situations where people are coming to, to work at 7 o'clock in the morning to teach history, and they're there till 8 o'clock at night covering a basketball game. Um, without reclassifying that as well, what we're not able to do as an association in future negotiations is extend that contract, similar to what we do for our deans and our counselors, because they are coming in over the summertime, they are coming in over break to get things worked. Our athletic directors, fall sports don't happen unless they come in over the summer to get things ready. They have to be in there over covering basketball tournaments over winter break and, and spring break for, for, uh, for baseball and various sports. And again, we can't go in there and negotiate for them and extend their contracts and make them more equitable as we would be able to for a dean or for a counselor or how, the, how WESPA does for their administrators on extended contracts if they're classified as an elementary teacher. We are fully aware that by doing so, you are going to impact the allocations, the classroom allocations at school sites. So, you know, picture perfect world, we would be able to provide a full-time allocation and not be impacting the other departments. Um, and, and I just will say that while at all of the high schools, not all of them are teaching classes. All of them absolutely have responsibilities, whether it's a testing administrator or whether it's overseeing office aides or whatever kind of the discretion of the administrator is at all of the high schools and that go beyond the scope of just their athletic uh, director responsibilities. So while, yes, they're not all teaching a class, they all have roles and responsibilities. And so we really need to make sure that we are, we are addressing this both from a classification standpoint and then um, from an allocation. But overall, thank you so much for the work you guys have done on this budget. Thanks. Thank you, President Evans. Carl Coppola. Welcome, Mr. Coppola. Um, 
it's, it's not on. Hi, Carl Kopeck uh, from Gerlach, Nevada, for the record. Uh, um, thank you uh, for all the hard work you've done on this budget and uh, uh, all your hard work you've done for the children of Washoe County. I, I really appreciate everything, um, your hard work and efforts, especially in this era of divisiveness and, and um, what it takes to be a public service servant in this day and age. It, it uh, takes a special person and personality to persevere throughout everything we're going through. Um, up in Gerlach, we, we have a sort of a unique community. We're 100 miles from here in the middle of nowhere, and uh, we have a pretty substantial school that is sort of the feature and highlight of our community, and there's some associated housing for the teachers that go with that housing, but it is not one of the features and highlights of the community. It has kind of gotten derelict. The town of Gerlach gave the land for that that housing to the Washoe County School District is uh, several years ago, and um, it has sort of fallen into disrepair. It is not a feature of the community. It is a one of the less desirable parts of town, and it is in the middle of the town. I come here on behalf of the town to respectfully ask that the school board improve the general upkeep of that property, and because we are experiencing housing crisis in Gerlach, consider putting some additional housing on those now two vacant lots of the five to give us incentive to get some more educators up here. We're losing one of our educators to who is moving on, who lives in a very nice house, and that position, I'm not sure, it will probably need to be filled, but there is a, just a, there is no housing available in Gerlach for love or money or rent, but you all have, are in the position to provide a, a, a some housing and, and improve what you have. Um, I would like to pay respect for one of your employees, Israel, who is on the, the ball and doing an amazing job in the last year remediating some of the invasive weeds that completely overwhelmed the, the school there, and it's looking a lot better, but that's just one phase of landscaping, the getting rid of the blight and now getting moving on toward beautification. Um, and I would like to see some of that, please, um, in, in lieu of the, the housing, at least, working with the university and some of the landscaping potential that's in-house in, in here in the county, in the community, getting some trees, shrubs, and perennials planted uh, w that would uh, affect the community greatly, the morale of the town and the school. Uh, thank you very much for your time, and any consideration you can give to this matter, we would greatly appreciate it. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you very much, Mr. Kopeck, and I apologize for mispronouncing your name. Thank you for your advocacy on that. That's all. That's all I have for this item. All right, let's bring it back to this board then. Um, so uh, one of the things, let's just dive right into it, guys, because it's time we've had some fantastic conversations. We've really explored a lot of things. So let's start moving toward um, action on some of these things. Uh, there is, there's one that we're going to have to tackle. So we could. There's, there's a few different things, of course, based on what any trustee wants, um, but we do know that we have several options to choose from as it relates to, I think it's slide 15, um, because in this example, this is not a firm recommendation. There's several options here, although we did hear from Chief Moore. So I would encourage us to focus on this, and then there may not be any other um, micro-level decisions that we make besides this one. There certainly could be, uh, but let's go ahead and, and maybe start here and start making some decisions if we could. Uh, Trustee Church. Basically a question. Could we have a fourth motion or a fourth option to just delegate to Chief Moore to proceed as he sees fit? So... It's my understanding he created these options, but we ultimately allocate the funding. So he's created these. He's weighed in on the one that he has a personal preference for, but we are the ones that control the purse strings, so we would have to choose one of these um, as offered to us. Because even if we said, let's do the one that Chief Moore wants, um, we still have to vote on that to actually pass that one. Clerk Rodriguez. Uh, I will start. Um, so we can just make a motion on this particular slide on, the, on this item, correct? So yeah, so we, we do have to make a decision yeah. on this. Unlike the other items, there's multiple options here. 
Um, I guess I'll take a shot at this. Um, I move that the Board of Trustees uh, approves option C in regards to school police vehicles at high schools. I second. All right, motion by Clerk Rodriguez, seconded by Trustee Westlake. A very polite Trustee Nicolette was in the wings, though. Um, seeing no lights on, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. All right, motion carries seven to zero. Now, I don't know that we have any other, we could. So guys, remember, we control the purse strings here. Um, but if there are no other individual level changes, then uh, what we would be interested in is a blanket motion um, for the Board of Trustees to approve the tentative budget for fiscal year 2024-25, including the previous motions as adopted. So I'll just look for that. So moved. Um, is there a second? I second. All right, and we'll open it up for discussion because I do see Trustee Church's light on. <clears throat> Thank you. This is, we've been down this road before. It's a tough decision because if I could go through with a fine tooth comb, I'd cut stuff and I'd add stuff. Definitely the athletic director issue. Um, I want to personally opine that if, if it was my call, I would cut the DEI or diversity department by six positions. I think that's overstaffed and could be better used in other positions such as athletic director. Um, but the problem is we're part of a team and we have to vote as a team and we can't all go th through and cut everything we want. So I just want to put that on the record, but again, there's no discussion of cutting DEI, but if there could be, or if I'd make a motion, I'd cut six positions, not all of it, but six positions out of that. Okay, um, continuing conversation on the item, Trustee Westlake. What, what would that save, or what would that well, net us? We, we don't even have that. I mean, so if we, if we adopt the budget, like here's the thing, it's something we absolutely could have talked about, and we can certainly talk about it in the future, but we're five, six meetings into this. These are like the types of recommendations that we make in the very beginning. So for example, someone could come in and say, I completely want to eliminate DEI. That's one of the things that we as a board would have voted on to have them do an analysis on. Doesn't stop us from doing it in the future, um, but that's, for one, we have a different motion on the floor right now, but that's certainly something that could be done in the future. So if Trustee Church has an interest in formally cutting the office of DEI, that's something we could talk about anytime if you had a second. So an interest like that is never stopped by this process. Thank you, Thank you very much, President Smith. And I would just caution the board, there are employees behind these FTEs. And so when we talk about cutting, I just wanna caution the board that these are actually employees that are working in our school district very hard every day. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Um, wasn't able to get my light on quick enough, I suppose, but um, I'm gonna go, I would like to go back to slide 12 and perhaps ask uh, uh, Trustee Nicolette and uh, Westlake, like, if maybe we can explore this just a little bit more as far as like if we can uh, pull this and maybe have a little bit more discussion with Chief Moore and staff and maybe bring this back to the next board meeting. Like, do we need to necessarily get rid of this position? Can we look at maybe take one of those officer vacancy positions and make that a sergeant to fill Tracy Moore's needs um, right now? Because I know how long it takes to run a background, do a psych, do a PT test, do all these things. Um, I just I hate to get that position up, you know, especially since we flag bearers kind of worked hard to get that. So something I would like to my two colleagues. Mm -hmm. I, I'm okay with, so would that be like a friendly? Okay, so here's what would probably have to do because we would not be passing the budget as they recommended it. We would probably have to vote on this, vote it down, and then come back to this item because what uh, Clerk Rodriguez is suggesting is that, remember how we approved the certain number of officers over the schools? We would be then taking one of them out of that and then repurposing it in this way, which is something that we could do. That's a big decision for us right now, but we could absolutely do that. 
but we wouldn't be approving the budget the way that it is because if we if we approve this motion then it includes this in it so we would be giving a direction to completely take one of the officers out of the middle school rotation and converting it over to a different role it's a very very different discussion we can have it but I don't know that there's a way forward on a friendly on this it would probably have to fail and then we would have to bring that back now which we can absolutely do but I think that this is way outside of what just a friendly could adjust um, because we would also have to consider the savings because that twelve thousand four hundred forty three dollars has to come somewhere and we can find it okay so I want to make it really clear that all of this is possible it's just that we're not really passing it at that point um, Thank I, yeah I just wanted to ask do we have the eight we have the eight positions budgeted for but they're not filled and that could take gosh going through the post and clearance and all that I mean we could be two three years out so I mean I think the the savings would be okay covered that way because I don't think we can fill all those positions right now at some point we'd have to address that so there there could be and so there could be salary savings but this is like the permanent staffing so we would be making a decision potentially right now to completely take one of those eight officers out and I do believe that there is recruitment that's happening I just want to make it really clear that like what the restructuring would be for this and I'm not weighing in on it one way or the other I just want to make it very very clear um, what that would really be looking like um, only just so everybody's eyes wide open on this and I do know that uh, Chief Moore is doing some recruitment I don't want to put him on the spot with this because his recruitment for these positions is outside the scope of this um, but there's a there's a few different dynamics here. I just want to make it really clear that this is something we could talk about. We would just have to see the motion through and then completely open it as a separate item because there isn't a way to actually pass this and then convert one of the positions as a friendly. Madam President, if I may, um, look, I, I, I see this is kind of getting out a little bit. Um, so I'll just make a statement and you know we can carry on with the vote. I'll, I'll see. If, you know, um, I have to trust the church, but I, I, I I'll be honest. I don't like this at all um, I think this is an easy answer um, and, and and I don't know where it's coming from but I, I get that we need sergeants on the road 100% I understand that we also need chain of command and uh, this is a growing department this is a good problem to have but it, um, I don't like this at all I hope we can revisit this I hope we can look at bringing the LT position back It is definitely key in an organization especially as large as our school police is getting um, but I, I, I can't say enough. I, I think it's the easy answer, and there's problems that need to be fixed on those pay scales to make sure this is getting solved correctly. Thank you, and I agree. Trustee Woodley? Yeah, thank you, Madam President. And, I, and I, you just stated with the, the obvious for me as well. I, I agree as well, and I understand his frustration, especially because when we initially approved it, we did say lieutenant. We actually upgraded from sergeant to lieutenant. So I definitely understand it. I, do, I too, do want to pass this budget. So um, I think they've heard us, and I think the chief knows um, that we would like to see more administrative in his uh, department um, for the overall safety and, and, and productivity of the department. So. Uh, I agree with um, with our secretary, with our clerk. Thank you. Yeah, and I will add that this is exactly why we raised up safety and connection as a beam across the entire plan and grew the department. And so by growing the department and welcoming a new chief, we're not accomplishing what our goal was by not properly staffing it and having the right chain of command. And Clerk Rodriguez is absolutely correct about there needing to be um, opportunities for growth and advancement when our chief and our deputy chief um, and the, the need for a lieutenant and so I completely agree with that um, and I, I think it's really clear how we're signaling at the moment um, and this is something I would definitely like to see as well. No, thank you very much President Smith and you know I can appreciate all of the comments from our trustees and, and I know that you all have full faith and confidence in our chief and it's one of the reasons why I brought forward that recommendation to hire Chief Moore, um, and now we have a deputy chief. And so I appreciate 
um, all of the comments made by the trustees, and I have full faith and confidence, as you all do in our chief, in order to establish the correct staffing for his department. Thank you. All right, thank you all for that. So on that, um, we have a motion by Trustee Nicolette, seconded by Trustee Westlake, if I have that correct. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. All right, motion carries seven to zero. Uh, so we're gonna go ahead and take a break. I wanna um, note a few things. So we're gonna go ahead and take a break. Let's go ahead and reconvene around 4.15. And then as a note to our guests in the audience, we will actually be continuing with item 4.02, because right now um, following the closure of this 3.01 and closing all of section three, we'll be moving on to section four. We do have some families with us. So out of respect for them, when I reconvene, we will be starting with item 4.02. Thank you so much.
All right, everyone. It is 4.18 p.m., and I'm going to call back to order this regular meeting of the Washoe County School District Board of Trustees meeting. It is April 9th, 2024. And now we've opened Section 4. These are our items for presentation, discussion, information, and or action. And um, as the meeting manager, I'm going to go ahead and uh, open item 4.02. This is our quality of education presentation. It's under strategic plan goal three, safety and belonging. Review of student and staff climate survey data and key strategies used to improve student learning outcomes. This is an item for presentation and discussion only. And we welcome with us today, uh, Dr. Mike Paul, our associate chief, and then also Principal Amanda McWilliams, a principal at Hunter Lake Elementary School, go Dragons. And then we have Eli Shum a Shoemaker, a student in the fifth grade, also at Hunter Lake, a proud dragon right now. All right, uh, take it away, Dr. Paul. All right, good afternoon, Superintendent McNeil, trustee, or President Smith and trustees. I'm Associate Chief Mike Paul, and I'm happy to introduce agenda item 4.02, highlighting our strategic plan, goal number three, safety and belonging, along with a review of our uh, staff and student climate surveys today. Um, to start, I am very excited to be able to introduce some special guests that we have with us today, Principal Amanda McWilliams from Hunter Lake and our superstar student of the day, Eli Shoemaker. Um, Eli and Principal McWilliams are going to get us started today to let us know some of the great things that are happening um, in a caring and engaging place at Hunter Lake Elementary School that allow for academic success to soar. And then, of course, we will pause for some pictures with all of us after Eli and Principal McWilliams share their story at Hunter Lake. And then from there, we are going to be hearing from Dr. Laura Davidson and Dr. Sarah Tresher from the Office of Continuous Improvement. They're going to join us here at the table um, to review some of our district uh, staff and student climate survey data that go along with, with our strategic goal, Plan 3. Um, and see how that all fits together with um, Hunter Lake and why we brought these two together today. Some very interesting data that we'll be going over with. Um, so first I want to, before we start with Amanda and Eli, our WCSD promise we will know every student by name, strength, and needs so that they graduate prepared for the future they choose and will deliver on this promise in partnership with our families and community. I want to say that with that promise, I think it's very relevant on goal three today with safety and belonging. Um, while of course it's very relevant every day and all that we do with all of our children and our communities and our parents, um, safety and belonging certainly fits into our climate surveys and what we do with this promise every day. So it really resonates with me the first time I read this when I was going through and understanding what we were going to be doing today and then going through the climate survey data and the strategies and what we're going to be talking about today definitely sticks out today with what we're talking about. So without further ado, I would like to have Principal McWilliams and Eli steal the show today. Good afternoon. I'm so, so happy to be here and honored Dr. McNeil, President Smith and trustees. I'm Amanda McWilliams, the principal of Hunter Lake, and I've been the principal there for 12 years. Um, this is our star student today, and I also have a bunch of my other students here. This is Eli Shoemaker, and he's a fifth grader at Hunter Lake. Uh, over here is uh, Emily Shoemaker, his sister in fourth grade, and then two students also um, in fifth grade, Gray Andrus and Nico Firestone, who came to cheer us on. So uh, I'm going to talk about this wonderful young gentleman. Uh, he is the three-time gold award winner uh, for academic behavior and excellence in um, everything that he does. He's an outstanding student and a student leader. He's been the student of the month in December. He is the co-manager of the Dragon Dollar Store that he helps me run every week. And uh, he manages all the other students. Um, and there's about six or seven that work in there with us. And he is my main man. And then he contributes to the school. This year he started something that you see in front of you, which is the Dragon Dash. He is the editor and creator of that, along with these fine uh, students in the back here, and uh, he just he just does uh, anytime I need help, he's my main man, and so I'm very pl proud and pleased to have him here, Eli Shoemaker. Good afternoon, and thank you for allowing me to be part of this meeting. My name is Eli Shoemaker, and I am a fifth grade student at Hunter Lake Elementary School. I am here in hopes of sharing my 
part of my school experience with each of you. A big part of my school experience has been including the multiple extracurricular activities that have been offered. A big part of a big part of my school experience has been has included the multiple extracurricular activities that have been offered. Our school has participated in Lego First Challenge for three years. I was able to participate in this challenge for two. Our team, the Dragon Boss, continues to teach many valuable lessons, such as teamwork, perseverance, and sportsmanship. Our music teacher, Mr. Fleming, is the coach and was awarded coach slash mentor award this year. Additionally, the girls at Hunter Lake Element Tree can participate in the STEAM program sponsored by the Seroptimus Club. Many skills learned by my friends have been creating websites, cooking food with alternative power sources, and coding Sphero balls. At the beginning of the school year, I had an idea that I wanted to create a school newspaper. After getting a group of friends together, we presented the idea to our school principal, Ms. Wink Williams, and she gave us approval. This is when the Dragon Dash was created. We are thrilled to have published two issues as well as having a third that will come out at the end of the school year. This project has given several fourth, grade, fourth and fifth grade students the opportunity to learn about interviewing, editing, and following deadlines. I am so grateful that our ideas are accepted and our talents are highlighted at Hunter Lake. Over the year, Hunter Lake has encouraged after-school participation of students and their families by offering a large amount, a large annual fall festival, bingo nights, family math nights, and school dances. My school has created a positive place for students to grow and to become their best selves. We earn Dragon Dollars for positive behavior and academic success and can term that earned money in for special rewards including stuffed animals, pizza and ice cream parties, and even becoming Principal of A. Many of my friends and I have pooled our money together to purchase class prizes, and I did have the opportunity last year along with my sister Emily to be the Principal. That was a tough job. <laughs> In addition to earning Dragon Dollars, we also have a self-manager award for students that are chosen by their teachers. Self-managers receive badges to wear, have a special bulletin board highlighting each student, and have self-manager parties. These parties typically have a snack and organized activities such as decorating a friend as a Christmas tree or playing ultimate rock, paper, scissors. Each month, we have a student of the month assembly where one student is chosen from each teacher to be highlighted. We all get to cheer our classmates on and celebrate the positive things going on within our school community. Additionally, we have a student voted by each classroom that is selected for character of the month. This is a special award as it is chosen by our peers. This year, our counselor, Miss Manna, put together a career exploration week. During the week, we had the opportunity to have large um, construction equipment on our school campus and we even got to move the digger around. On Friday of that week each class had three to five parents come speak about their careers. My class had a nurse, someone who creates slot machines, a tech designer, a massage therapist, and an archaeologist. That was an awesome experience where we got to learn and ask questions. The best part of my elementary school journey has been being taught by my teachers. The Hunter Lake Elementary, hands down, has amazing and caring staff that I feel comfortable learning from. Thank you so much, Eli. Great job. We are so proud of you. And now I will turn it over to Superintendent Dr. Kristen McNeil for some good news, and we'll celebrate you. Well, thank you so much, President Smith. That was amazing, Eli. That is awesome. And, you know, I'm a big believer in, in mentorship. And we have somebody in the audience who actually works at a newspaper and who is an actual real life reporter. And that is Siobhan McAndrews. Wave, Siobhan. There she is. And I'll bet you she would love to do an interview with you and your whole entire newspaper team. So that is just amazing. That is awesome. So thank you so much. And we're not finished yet. We have a WCSD Student Superstar Award for you. And we're gonna present it to you now.
right, well, we're excited to continue. All right, well, at Hunter Lake, everyone belongs. And I think it's um, really important that we have built a culture together, our staff and um, our families and our students about, um, we celebrate every student their stories, their lives, their families, whatever their family is, we honor and celebrate that. And so um, every student, of course, is known by name and face and, and story. And I think that that is a very important part of our school. And uh, we believe that together we really can change the world for students um, because it doesn't matter your zip code, it doesn't matter your last name, it doesn't matter any of those things. What matters is that together we can build academic excellence and um, provide support for students <clears throat> in their lives. All right, so some of the things that we do at Hunter Lake, uh, and you see my students there, they have, uh, they have made one of their other students into a Christmas tree, and so that is one of our self-manager uh, parties. Um, we do math nights, a lot of parent invitationals, bingo nights, dances, all school sing-alongs, a monthly character award, a lot of different things to bring in all kinds of different uh, interested parties and to make parents and students feel welcome and part of what we're doing at school every day. Uh, this is my awesome staff uh, and most of these folks have been with me at least 10 years. And so uh, we do a lot of things to celebrate staff too. Uh, we do dance parties too. And uh, we, have <laughs> we have birthday celebrations. We do um, a quarterly what's working and what's not so that they have a voice and that they feel that they can contribute. Um, they are the, the authors of the school performance plan. They are the authors of the walkthrough plan. And so all of that buy-in makes them know that that is their school and I am merely there to facilitate and cheerlead for them. And on that note, I'm going to jump in and say that I love Hunter Lake. It's one of the schools in my area. I love visiting it. And when you say that you're also a cheerleader of them, I get to see that as well, too. You have a wonderful school with such a beautiful spirit. You have a nice variety of students that are there. And I love to see those self-managers working in the lunchtime. And you can see their, their leadership. And it, you just... I'm just such a big fan of, of Hunter Lake. It's been around in this community for a very long time, so there's a long history there, and you've also been a leader there so well. So we just really appreciate you. Thank you. Thank I appreciate you so much. That. Thank you, President Smith, Superintendent Dr. McNeil, members of the board. For the record, Dr. Laura Davidson, Director of Research and Evaluation. Also like to introduce Dr. Sarah Tresher, who oversees the climate survey in our office. And you'll be hearing from her tonight, um, but she's really the one who runs the day-to-day -day administration of the climate survey. So tonight we're going to be talking about climate survey data, and there's a lot of reasons why we collect this data and why we think it's important to report out to the board periodically. First and foremost, uh, research is very definitive that school climate matters for teaching and for learning. There's a ton of research out there showing that when students attend schools that are safe, where there's a sense of belonging, where they feel cared about, where they feel like their identity can be heard and understood, students are far more likely to attend school regularly to graduate and to achieve academic excellence. Same for staff. Staff need working conditions that support them, and if they have those school conditions in place, they're far more likely to retain at that school. So it stops turnover. There's all kinds of reasons why we collect this data, and research is definitive about its importance. If that weren't enough, it's also in NRS that schools use school performance data, um, school climate data in their school performance plans. So it's a mandate by Nevada Department of Education, of course, that we collect it, but far more reasons uh, besides that to collect it. Um, and if that all weren't enough, it is also a foundational measure in our strategic plan. So you're going to be hearing a lot more about the student and staff climate surveys as we continue to report out on implementation of our strategic plan. 
So a little backdrop on how we collect this data. It's open every fall. We've been doing these surveys for well over a decade in our district. This is not the first time we've ever collected this data. We administer the survey to all students in grades 5 through 12, so you can see it is a sizable group of students who provide their feedback and their voices about our schools. And then our staff uh, survey is administered via email, so we send an email to all staff who are based in schools to complete the survey. So we're going to jump into some of the new questions that we've added this year. First, I want to just do a quick uh, calibration on the data slides that you're about to see. So sometimes on a survey when you say agree, it means a good thing, like staff at my school really care about me. Sometimes when you select agree on a survey, it's not such a good thing, like when students might say that bullying is an issue at their school. So for the purposes of all the slides you're going to see tonight, we've converted everything so you want higher numbers. Higher numbers are better, and over time you want to see them going up, you don't want to see them going down. So as you review the next couple of slides, I think that will help um, all of us kind of understand the direction that our survey responses are going over time. Okay, so these are new questions that we added this year, and of course everything that we do is uh, grounded in the WCSD promise to know every student by name, strength, and need. So this is the first year we've ever had these questions, but we added three to the teacher survey and three to the student survey just to get a baseline understanding of how many of our students and teachers feel like that promise is being fulfilled. On the right, you can see teachers almost unanimously agree that they know their students by name, strength, and need. Students also almost unanimously agree that they're known by name. And there's a little bit more variability, but still very high responses around being known by strength and need. Of course, lots of different interpretations of those words, so I think as we continue to roll out the strategic plan, it's going to be fascinating to kind of put students and uh, teachers um, in focus groups and interviews and really understand what does this promise look like in practice to them? What does it mean for a student? What does it mean for a teacher? As you can see on this slide, there are some differences in how students, based on the population groups that they're involved in, rate the fulfillment of the promise. So gifted and talented, Asian, white, multiracial students, uh, very high rates of agreement to these three questions and other population groups, not as much. So again, this is just baseline data, and, uh, but I think gives us a good sense of where we need to go and which students are um, experiencing our schools positively. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Tresher. She's going to first go through the student climate survey results, and then we'll pause for questions. And then we'll go through the staff climate survey results and pause again for questions. All right, so um, taking a closer look at our student climate, res climate survey results on this slide, we are looking at the results from the last three years. Um, and for each of these scales, students respond to between three and nine questions, and then we take an average of those. Um, and are, so we're looking at the percentage of students who are responding favorably to these questions. Um, so starting over on the left, things like safety, adult support, and respect, over two-thirds of our students have positive perceptions of that at our schools. Um, it does decline a little bit for student respect and student engagement. We see that just over half our students are responding favorably. And then we do see this downward trend for bullying and this is a trend in the unfavorable direction so that 43 percent that we see is saying that 43 percent of students are saying bullying is not an issue at their school um, we took a closer look at this because we were concerned about that and um, that trend there's three questions that make up that bullying scale and while all three questions do go down it's primarily driven by one question that we ask and that's our question around cyberbullying and two-thirds of our students are agreeing or strongly agreeing that students are spreading mean rumors or lies about others at their school on the internet so we wanted to point out really where that downward trend you see is coming from um on the climate survey we also can, ask can about i go back to that one sure thank you so what I'm seeing here is kind of an alarming trend. Every single category has gone down. Under the left, under safety, roughly 25, 24% don't feel safe. Is that, is that how I'm interpreting that? <clears throat> Yeah, thanks for the question. So things are moving. They're a little flat, but some are going down, and certainly bullying, as we pointed out, is definitely going down. Um, one, we've looked at this data. It's been flat for several years, which I think is surprising to us during the pandemic. We expected bigger changes. 
One thing that we think, as you probably noticed on the, our methodology slide, is that uh, we have a much higher response rate among our students this year. It went up a five or six percentage points, so we're um, getting the voices of more students who probably are the ones who may be missing school more often, maybe are a little more at risk. Um, they're the students that we haven't heard from as much on the survey for different reasons, so that could be contributing partially to some of these. Um, for the bullying uh, one, we did take a look at some of our bullying data. Um, we have not seen the same trend in our reported bullying. Um, that is on Nevada report card. So we haven't seen that trend in the actual reported data, but I think nationally we hear everywhere about cyberbullying and some of the challenges students are facing. So that particular trend was not a surprise to us. Just, <clears throat> pardon me, just to be clear, what you call flat, I see a 4% drop in two years in safety, and I see 24% of the students not feeling safe. Um, and I'm guessing it's probably higher in high school. I'm guessing if you can opine on that. Yeah, certainly in high school we see these numbers decline as you saw in the appendix in elementary school climate's at its highest and it does decline over time. The safety one in particular, I think we've noticed um, it's the question room restrooms. So safety in restrooms is probably driving the majority of that trend. I'm seeing our student representative nodding her head <laughs> vigorously to that. Um, so certainly, as I said before, we do not want to see these trending in this direction. We want it to see it moving up. Um, it does kind of parallel some of the behavior data that we've seen over time that has been increasing. So some of these trends are um, maybe not a surprise to us, but most of them are moving just a hair, and part of that could be the high, higher response rate right. in hearing from more students. I just want to emphasize my position here. I'm not happy. I mean, <clears throat> again, 24% don't feel safe. Look at the uh, student respect down to 58%. Um, I mean, th these are not good stats, in my opinion, unless I'm missing something, but thank you. Yeah, I would agree. We don't want any of our, we don't want half of our students saying they don't feel engaged in their learning or belonging. Um, this is data that's been pretty flat. If you look over the last seven, eight years, it's been around 50% in that particular area. These are numbers that we want to see higher, absolutely. On that note, why don't we invite the voice of our student representative into this conversation since she's actually in our schools. Thank you, President Smith. Um, I wanted to make a note on how I know that a lot of the bullying data was based on the cyberbullying data of agree or strongly agree that students often spread mean rumors or lies about others at school or on the internet. I just wanted to say, and this is kind of based off of interpretation, but typically bullying is a power imbalance and one person is really being targeted and not totally like fighting back because typically when it's like two people are in, um, you know, a disagreement or whatever, it's not necessarily considered bullying anymore. Um, a lot of, and this was how I answered this question, because I did say agree. Um, but for me, it was kind of like students spreading it to, like about each other. So it was kind of like students are having drama and they're like, so I don't know if we would classify that as bullying. I don't know or if that's just like a disagreement between students, but just something to note of like, I don't know if that would, all of those answers are specifically talking about cyber bullying rather than like, students just being mean to each other on the internet. <laughs> yeah, I think that's great feedback with all of these questions. One of my favorite things to do is to do interviews with students and understand how they're, what they're thinking about when they answer the questions. Bullying for sure has a very specific legal definition that I'm sure most students and probably most staff are not necessarily very familiar with. Um, so certainly interpretation factors into a lot of this. And the bullying questions, we received those from the the State Department of Education. Those are the questions that they want us to ask. Um, and they are about students as a whole. So is, is bullying an issue at my school? Not has bullying happened to me specifically? So it's an important difference. Well, thank you, Madam President. And I kind of have a follow-up question. So like uh, the 76% of students' um, safety, is, you know, uh, the rest is obviously a concern. Do they, do they explain why they're not feeling safe, or is this just because, like, national headlines, things going on, or unfortunate things are going on in our nation as far as, you know, violence in our schools? Is that kind of where maybe it's, you know, that experience that they see on the news? Um, is there any, like, a more substance to that? 
Yeah, it's a great question. In survey research, we call that reference bias. So things that are happening periodically um, right before the survey happens are probably impacting students' interpretation. I think in the case of cyberbullying, we hear constantly about cyberbullying. So I think one of the favorite things that we do with this climate survey data is do these data dives with students to understand why do you respond this way? What were you thinking about? Why, what do you think is driving this? Was there a recent event that happened just before the survey administration that might be impacting it? Because certainly we do see those spikes. Survey data is not perfect, but it's a great starting place to be having these important conversations and starting these um, data stories where we can bring in alternative data points to triangulate. Thank you. All right, uh, I'm going to move on to the social emotional competencies um, section. On the climate survey every year, we have 40 questions that ask students to rate um, their social emotional competencies and students um, indicate whether skills are easy or difficult for them to do. And so at this chart, you're looking at the percentage of students who are rating these skills as easy or very easy for them to do. Um, so starting over on the left with social awareness, going to relationship skills, you can see that two thirds to three quarters of our students are indicating these skills are easy for them to do. This does drop a little bit for our self-management skills. You can see on the right, those three skills um, are a little bit more difficult. Still over half are rating them as easy or very easy, but overall tend to just be a little bit more difficult for students. Um, so I want to bring attention to this. Um, so on this slide, you are looking at the questions that we ask for self-management of goals, emotions, and schoolwork, um, and how students responded to those. And again, just highlighting, because this is a little bit of more of a challenge area. And these are also the skills that are most strongly associated with academic outcomes compared to the other competency areas, particularly self-management of schoolwork, which we've highlighted here in yellow. Um, and because we've been collecting these data for a long time, we've been able to do some more robust longitudinal statistical analyses on these. Um, and we started that in high school, and we do find that students' growth in self-management of schoolwork, if they are able to get better at that skill throughout high school, this also predicts improvements in their GPA. Um, so this is an important skill. It's tied to academics. Um, it's also a skill that we can support our students with. It's, it's teachable. It's malleable. So we wanted to, to highlight that. Um, we'll take any more questions you have about the student survey. Um, if there's no more questions, I will hand it back over to Dr. Davidson, who's going to go over the staff results. I just have an interesting observation in that our students seem to be rating themselves very high in their abilities um, for responsible decision-making, self-awareness, relationship skills, yet a lot of the issues that we're seeing from the slide before are also among these same students. So um, I just, I just want to point that out, that our students seem to be rating themselves very high, but then this is the same body of students that feels like there's a lot of cyberbullying and meanness that's happening, so there must be a gap between self-perception versus what they feel is happening. So because if they were all really performing at this level for their own individual self-management and emotions, there would probably be less of this interpersonal. So I, I just wanted to bring attention to that because you can't help but notice that separation. It's a great point. Uh, we talk a lot about it, that um, the self-awareness, uh, you may rate yourself highly on that, but you also may not be able to rate yourself accurately. Um, so it's kind of an interesting dichotomy that uh, the students who maybe are not necessarily the best at these skills may rate themselves highly because they don't they don't necessarily know what excellence means in those um, in those particular skill areas. So. Okay, so we will um, close out with the staff climate survey results now. So this large slide here is showing all, not all, but most of the topic areas that we've tracked longitudinally on the staff climate survey. As you can see, probably immediately, uh, staff are rating the climate of their schools much more highly than students, so well into the 80, 90 percent in most of these topic areas. On the far right, you can see work stress, I think, stands out to all of us that uh, those numbers are a little bit lower. 
I wanted to dig into that measure in um, part because we've been tracking it for so long and particularly during the pandemic. So this is the one slide where higher numbers do not mean a better thing. Um, but you can see pre-pandemic in 2019-20, we had about 46% of our educators saying that they agreed or strongly agreed that they felt burnt out. That skyrocketed at the height of the pandemic when everything was very scary and new and the conditions for teaching were extraordinary. We're very happy to see that has declined over time. So we're about at pre-pandemic levels on this, but I don't think any of us are happy to see that 50% of our staff are reporting burnouts and really kind of low-level anxiety at work. So I think uh, the further we get away from the pandemic, we hope to see these numbers continue to decline, but it's a measure that we're going to continue tracking because we know it's very important for things like turnover and retention. Can we go back to the previous slide? There we are. This is kind of a red flag for me, parental involvement. I mean, it's improved slightly, but basically 49% um, are concerned about the lack of parental involvement. Can you comment on that? Yeah, sure. So these questions are asking staff, are parents in, of your students involved in your classroom? High school and middle school are largely driving. I mean, the numbers between elementary and secondary mm -hmm. are wildly different. I think there's very different expectations at the secondary level of how families can be involved in their learning. So I think a large part of that, if you were to split these out by school level, you'd see very dramatic differences. So I think that's probably driving the majority of it is very different perceptions about the family's role in their child's education for middle and secondary. Do we have a plan to fix that? I mean, that's a red flag. I would definitely wish that our Delisa Crane were here to talk about family engagement efforts, um, but it is data that we've talked about a lot, especially I think what's of note that we've talked a lot with Delisa Crane, who runs Family School Partnerships, is that difference between homeschool communication. So those questions on the far left there are asking teachers, do you communicate well with your uh, families? And you can see almost unanimous agreement there, but then when we ask teachers about whether the families are kind of giving the same sort of effort in the classroom, that's where we're getting these big differences. And we've talked a lot about the differences between those two and how can we um, invite some of our families in at the secondary level in particular. And I know she has a host of um, strategies that we um, can't get into here for, for, and I wouldn't want to do it without her, but um, many different strategies that do focus on classes for families. What does it look like to be involved at the secondary level? One more question, if I might. Where do I find the actual climate survey? I looked for it. Did I miss it in the attachment, or where do I find it? Yep, so um, we are just finalizing our reports, and we post these publicly, so you can actually see the last seven, eight years of our student, staff, and family climate surveys online. So we're a little bit delayed on getting these one up, but the, the survey is largely the same year over year. So that's a great place to start. Otherwise, we're happy to send you the full attachment with all the questions. Please, please do. I'd love to see it. I'm sure the other trustees probably don't want to speak for them, but I suspect they do. Thank you, President Smith. I just wanted to comment. I'm. I'm actually hoping that we improve in that area with the involvement um, because we at the I think it was the last board meeting I don't know I time flies away from me but <clears throat> we implemented things to kind of fast track and streamline uh, being able to be a volunteer and so I'm hoping that that makes it n less you know cumbersome for grandparents, parents, aunts, uncles, whomever wants to actually be a volunteer. I, th I think we're gonna see an uptick in that just, just with that little model that we put in place, allowing people to have a quicker access to being able to volunteer. It'll be interesting to see, but I, I kind of think it's gonna help with that. I'm, thank you. I think it's a great point. I think um, this is also another challenge with interpretation, right? Because I think many families in secondary would definitely agree that they're involved in their children's education. They're just not necessarily volunteering in the classroom and maybe their kids do not want them to volunteer in the classroom at that age. Um, but they're certainly involved. They're checking grades. They're figuring out how to fill out FAFSA forms. They're engaging in all kinds of different ways that maybe are not visible to teachers. And I, so I think that's part of why we see that difference between elementary and secondary on that particular question. 
Okay, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Mike Paul, who's going to talk about um, what this data looks like at a school level and how the data gets used by schools. All right, so as you see in these, these four bar graphs here, each one of these bars represents an individual school. So as you can see, there's a great, de de great degree of variability amongst all of our schools, and that's pretty much to be expected because each school has its own very unique climate and culture and how the school operates. So there's no surprise there. Um, the first two graphs, the top two graphs, um, those come from the student climate survey. So you have uh, the first one in blue, the adult support, and then the yellow and bullying over there. Uh, so an example of how that adult support um, data at an individual school site might be used, some of the examples of questions in the adult support category could be things like, um, my teacher cares about me, or um, I know I can get good grades if my teacher cares about how I, how I perform in class, and those kinds of questions. So when we look at those, when a teacher or a principal takes those questions in the survey, sits down with their staff, drills down into the why behind a question, do we see any patterns in these questions? Um, teachers, what are you hearing from your students that align with the information we're getting from this survey? That's where you can get why, down to the why. I think the word why is one of the most important words that we can continually use when we're planning. And that's where you can come up, well, based on these why of what kids are telling us in our survey, what are some of the most important or high impact SEL strategies that we can come up with that we can then um, deliver school-wide that we can put into our school performance plans so we can memorialize that and that's why we can we can monitor it we can make sure that we're following up on it that that is a focus for our school because this is what our kids are telling us we know this is what we need to have because through our surveys we can look at patterns over the years and we know this is what we need we're not just guessing for it guessing on what we need so that's a really important way that getting to that why and putting it in our SPP and developing those high leverage strategies knowing where it's coming from um, and that's as it's already been talked to in that bullying um, area that's you know we definitely need to have some attention there um, certainly the cyberbullying is prevalent more than it ever has been um, nationwide. Those are definitely national trends that we're seeing. Um, another question that I like that's in that bullying category is um, asking students if they are seeing that other students are stepping up to help prevent bullying. So it kind of goes both ways in that survey. So that's a very piece, important piece of information to find out how students are saying, are we helping each other as well? It's not just in the negative tone. So that's another thing to think of, of how kids are perceiving their school. So are, are, do our students feel that they're helping each other and it's not just all on what are we going to do to help, how can we help our kids help themselves to make it through these issues that we're perceiving. So those are some strategies we can put in place too on how to help our kids help themselves and build those self-confidence skills and build those skills to make them become better adults that we always want them to be. So those are where we can d drill down to those whys to come up with very specific strategies school-wide to help our students based on the questions in this climate survey. And then down on the bottom there come those two, those two bar graphs come from the um, staff climate survey. And um, you know, work stress certainly is always a very important one. We want to retain our staff. And you know, there's no question that you know, we have a lot of stress in every profession we have now. And education is probably right up there at the top. We all know how hard the job is for our teachers and all of our staff members. And I think the collegial collaboration goes hand in hand with trying to work with work stress, trying to deal with work stress. So when we're looking at a main question in work stress is burnout, I feel burned out. Then when we look over at collegial collaboration and staff working together, when we drill down into the collaboration, it is what, is, what, is, what are principals doing working with their leadership teams to get staff to work together? What are the areas that we can do as a staff to rely on each other to get staff buy-in and how decisions are being made. How are we working, the cliche, smarter, not harder. How are we working as a team to be able to alleviate some of that work stress so that you don't feel so burned out? So when we get down into that and we can work with our teachers and our leadership team and the rest of our staff based on what they're saying in the collegial collaboration and putting plans, 
into our SPP, one of the main goals, we have three goals in the as student perform in the school performance plan. One of them is all about adult, adult learning culture. So we can put very specific strategies into the school performance plan. Yes, they're academic strategies, but it's about how our staff works together to improve student success so that we're not a bunch of lone rangers out there working to increase that work stress. So this, that, that those two areas really do work hand in hand to increase student success. When teachers are happy, then the students are gonna succeed more. So they really go together. So those are two very important areas that we'll work together for our school performance plan and student success. And then in addition with with everything working together, we come to this slide on chronic absenteeism. And as we all know, absenteeism is extremely detrimental to learning. There's no question about that. If the students are not there, they're not going to be learning. And so these are certainly aligned to national trends. Um, and the more students feel cared about, the more they are engaged in their learning, the more they are going to be coming to school. Um, we can talk all day about factors that are outside of our control in the environment, in the community as to why um, students are not coming to school, but then there are certain, there certainly are factors that we do have control of that, can, that we can encourage and we can make schools feel like that place where students want to come to school. And that goes back to factors in looking at our climate surveys. What are students saying about their school? Do they feel safe? Do they feel like they want to come to school? going back to that perception of how their teachers make them feel at school. Do they feel cared about? Do they feel engaged? Do they feel like some, they can get good grades if someone helps them? Those questions, so that's where a staff and a principal can drill down into those individual questions to see do we have a pattern in a certain area that they're finding in those climate surveys where there is an issue at their school and their climate where, wait a minute, if we deal with these certain issues that we're seeing that students are answering, we can address that in certain practices, whether it's an SEL practice, whether it's a practice on how we collaborate together to address this so students are gonna feel more comfortable coming to school and then we can get them to come more often because they want to be here and they're going to come more, which will in turn help that chronic absenteeism so they're at school learning more. So the climate survey on staff and student is, is one of the most important tools that we have to address so many different areas when those results are used in a very appropriate manner to address a whole lot of areas and not just saying, oh, yeah, we're doing a great job, let's just keep on going, so. Thank you, President Smith. <clears throat> we know relationships are so very important, consistency and working together, and I find it curious, it's not a criticism, I just find it curious that there's not a slide for relationship between climate and absenteeism for staff. I think that would be an interesting look-see. Certainly something we can do and put together, and I agree, I'd be fascinated to see if there's a relationship there. So with that, any further questions? Thank you, President Smith. So I'm, I'm thinking this is appropriate to ask this now, and there might not be an exact definitive answer to this, but with the cyberbullying, I just can't help but think, I know we're, we're kind of looking at and working on a cell phone policy. I can't help but think that if we get something, a policy in place for cell phone. I mean, we're, humans are creatures of emotions. And I mean, they can flare like that. I can't help but think if we get a cell phone policy in place, if that, if that means isn't readily handy when Johnny is just furious with Sammy or Christy is furious with Jane, and that cell phone is hot and handy right then and there to ch -ch 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 throw something out there onto a social platform. If there's a time of cooling down, I know I do it. I mean, things will make me so angry, but as, as you get older, you, you try and take that step back, and I'm so thankful because in that hot instant, I could just be throwing something out there very quickly, students haven't really learned that management of their emotion and 
they don't take that those few steps to take a couple of deep breaths i mean some do some do there it, it's great but if there was a policy in place do you think that that would go down if there's that cooling off period i mean by the time they get home they've maybe gone to football practice or to their club and so their anger or their issue probably is cooled i would think would have cooled down and so maybe their instantaneous of putting up something nasty they're they're not going to be so inclined to i mean what what do you think I'll, I'll help you out there, Dr. Paul. <laughs> so I, I would agree um, that within the school setting, you know, the more removal um, that we have as far as these, you know, the devices, and we are working on something such as that. And, you know, Clark County School District, as you all know, they have implemented such a cell phone policy. The, the truth of the matter is, is that these devices go outside of our schools and they are with our students basically 24 seven. And so a lot of these issues with bullying, they actually happen on weekends, happen at night, and then they filter back into the school. And that's where our administrators and our teachers are dealing with types of issues that happen outside of the school setting. And so that's where we're asking our parents to get um, educated and help as far as what type of platforms your students are using, when your students are using the phones, do they have access 24 seven to their phones? Is it in a separate room? I mean, we have parents here on, on you all are parents and these things are happening. So there's, there's a part of it that we can handle, right? That we can help with a cell phone policy, but it's outside of the school doors that we're going to need community help with that as well too. Thank you, President Smith. I 100% agree with Dr. McNeil. I think I'm just echoing what she says, the drama is gonna happen. And it just kind of depends on, is it gonna happen inside the school during school hours or is it gonna happen outside of school? And I think even if when students are feeling really emotional, if they're really upset at someone, they could wait all school day, they're still gonna do something about it after school because they're gonna go talk to their friends, they're gonna be like, what should I do about this? Like, they did this to me. And then like, they're gonna be like, oh, you should do this. And then they'll go and do it. So it's kind of, but I, I totally think with the cell phone policy of just decreasing that impact inside of school of how much that's gonna affect their learning and all of that. Um, but I think the drama is gonna happen and it's just kind of a uh, part of life, but it's also something that we can try and build that better community to um, even have less conflict between students because you know, it's it's a hard thing, but but yeah. Yeah, I'll also add that the school district doesn't buy the phones for the kids. And as, as a parent where one of my children does have this, um, there's some capacity building, like ultimately I'm responsible for what my children do. And so there's reviewing of the phones, there's understanding the accounts that they're on. So there's some capacity building there, but this is why our promise is in partnership with families and communities because there's a role here for our families to be playing. And so when we look at some of that data around bullying and safety, a lot of that drama is happening well outside of school hours. It's not as if, and I wanna make this very clear, it's not as if this is only happening in school and then everyone's going home and being well monitored and then playing nicely in the sandbox. These are things that are happening around the clock. And let's be honest, it was like that for us too. It's just back in my day, you had to wait and find out what somebody said at a sleepover, which might not have happened for like three or four days. Now it's all instantaneous. So I just wanna bring that attention that the school district doesn't buy the phones. There's a role for families to be playing in this too and, and an ownership and a responsibility with it too. All right, and seeing no other lights on, thank you so much for this item. We appreciate it very, very much. And that closes item 4.02 and brings us back to item 4.01, also an item for presentation and discussion and for presentation and discussion to provide updates regarding the superintendent search for the Washoe County School District by McPherson and Jacobson. And we welcome with us now uh, Dr. Walt Cooper of McPherson and Jacobson, who's with us, and Katie Louise Weir, our interim chief talent officer. And also Michelle Anderson, our chief 
of communications and engagement. Thank you, President Smith and trustees. I, I'm okay to jump in, I assume? Okay. It's good to see you all again. We really need to talk about my place on the agenda, though. I've been at having to follow Eli this time, the kids last time. It's just, it is absolutely not fair. Um, my work stress is going up as a result of that. But it is good to, it is good to be with you all again. Um, I have a couple of slides just um, to talk a little bit about updates, give you um, a few points on where we are today. Um, and then um, we'll talk about the, the path forward. I'm certainly happy to answer any questions um, that you have. But this first slide uh, simply is a, a visual reminder of where we started and what we've accomplished. Um, you may be wondering, you know, what you were paying us for because you haven't seen a lot of this work directly. Um, but it was um, a little over two months ago that we started, and we have now gone through all of these tasks up to the application deadline, which was um, the middle of March. Um, and I will tell you that um, in terms of that application deadline, um, this um, the candidates, the application uh, applicant pool for, uh, for this position, um, quite frankly, far exceeded our expectations. So in, in looking back at some data points from, for comparison, right, for the, from the, the previous search, um, we more than doubled the number of, of candidates who showed interest in Washoe County School District uh, in, in this pool, which was uh, outstanding. Uh, what we, we really thought was a remarkable um, response for, for a district of this size, magnitude, complexity, um, so we, we were very pleased with that. We had over 30 applicants total, um, which, was, which is an outstanding number, um, wherever it is. And just a couple of, um, a couple of uh, points within that. So um, two-thirds of, of this applicant pool were applicants new to us. And what I mean by that was it, they, it was not populated solely by the usual suspects, right, that we see in almost every search that we post, and we see them in every search that we post because they're not getting a job in any search that we post. Um, so we, we did not see a lot of that kind of activity. We also um, uh, create significantly more work on our part, but that's a good thing because we don't know these folks like we've known either either through previous searches or Dr. Joel and I have, you know, our, our recently uh, retired practicing superintendent, so we had a lot of professional collegiality across the country where we might have run into some folks as well. Um, so the combination of those two things still yielded two-thirds of the pool being, being new to us, um, which we were, uh, we were pleased to see. And uh, as, at least as far as we can tell, um, and when I say that, that means that of all of the the uh, searches that McPherson Jacobson currently is is doing nationwide, plus the conversations that we've had with candidates, the vast majority of candidates for this position were only applicants for Washoe County School District, um, and so I, that that speaks highly um, as well. And then finally, um, the uh, uh, there's a. A little anecdote that we kind of talk about uh, internally, but I'll, I'll share it with you. And this speaks to the the, the fact that y you all put forth uh, the directive to us to bring up to five finalists, um, which will happen here pretty soon um, on the 15th, uh, for your consideration. And we often talk about sometimes the um, uh, the the clear mark of how strong the candidate, the final candidates are uh, lies in the strength of the candidates that don't make it to the finals. And that will certainly the case as we're going through this. We haven't, haven't yet set our, our final candidate slate, but I can tell you that that absolutely will be true in this instance that the, um, each candidate who, who will come forth as a, as a finalist, right, obviously their strengths will be 
uh, clearly evident to you as you review their materials and you interview them and all. But what you won't see is the relative strength of the folks that did not make the finals, and that will speak vol that all to us. That speaks volumes about the quality of the folks that do make the cut, if you will. Um, so with that, um, this now really is largely moving forward. Um, thank you to all of you, uh, to each of you, uh, because you all submitted your uh, questions to me in a timely manner. Um, I did not circle back um, with any of you on your questions because there was very, very little redundancy um, that we had to uh, that we had to consider. Um, I'll get to that and uh, I'll, I'll put a pin in that for a second, and I'll talk about that in just a minute for um, a few items down here. Um, but right now we are uh, in the process of awaiting for selected candidates to complete their videos and submit those to us. That deadline is tomorrow. Uh, then we will go back through and do another round of uh, evaluation and calibration. Dr. Joel and I will do that um, in preparation for uh, the public announcement of finalists, which is slated, um, we said, on or about <laughs> April 15th. Um, Probably shouldn't say this at the mic, but I think we're going to hit April 15th. I'm pretty, pretty confident that's going to be the day. Um, but then between those two, so that April 10th to 14th, I just want to highlight this for a minute. So I've heard back from most of you. Most of you have responded to my invitation uh, to schedule one-on-one um, -on -one Zoom uh, meetings in preparation for your activities on uh, April 26th. Um, when, uh, for those of you that haven't had a chance yet to respond, I will ping you again just to remind you of that. But I have lots of time available between tomorrow, actually, um, and Sunday to uh, have these conversations. And in those conversations, we'll talk, um, we'll talk about those questions. There, there are uh, a couple of you I need to refine um, exactly how you will frame, <coughs> excuse me, if, uh, frame those conversations. We'll talk a little bit about protocol, schedule, expectation, those, those kinds of things. Um, and um, we'll review the rules uh, for, for engaging in uh, defensible hiring practices and making sure that you know, everybody stays within the, within the rails um, for what we need to do in that regard. Um, uh, but primarily we'll go over the uh, want to make sure that everybody is and that we're clear as we put together uh, that script and and plan for the 26 that we're we're solely solid on each of your questions um, and so we'll go over those again um, two things that I that I just will um, uh, finalize here so uh, in very general terms on April 26th when the trustees are engaged with in-person interviews with the candidates. Um, the schedule that we've put together and are proposing would have you all convening at 9 o'clock that morning, um, obviously getting, getting set and calling your meeting to order and going through what you, uh, what you need to do there, with then the first interview being scheduled at, to start at 9.15. We will schedule then interviews on 75-minute increments um, beginning at 9.15. We'll, have a, we'll do three interviews, uh, break for a short lunch, and then come back and do two interviews after lunch. Uh, the, the four, uh, if, there, if there are five finalists, and I'm, I'm virtually confident there will be five. Um, if not, we'll just, short, we'll just move everything, everything up in the day. Um, and the protocol will be we are going to um, limit uh, each question to four minutes. So each of you submitted two questions, so we will do two rounds. So we will go uh, around the dais, four minutes per trustee. And that's one of the things I want to talk about when we have the Zoom meeting is how you want to prioritize your questions in order and that sort of thing. Um, so we'll do that four minutes. Then we'll go around the dais again, four minutes. We'll bookend that with the opportunity for each candidate to give an introduction, introductory statement, introduction, and also a closing. Um, but we will watch the clock very, very carefully. We want to be fair and equitable to all the candidates. We also want to help you avoid interview fatigue, which is a very real thing that can happen. 
um, and we want to be um, we want to avoid that in fairness to all candidates. Um, and so, uh, and April 26th is going to be here before we know it. So, uh, but we'll talk about that in a little more detail um, when we have our Zoom conversations, our one-on-one -on -one conversations. So, if if in between now and then you have some questions that percolate about what that, please jot those down and make sure um, that you you ask those of me, and I'll do my best to answer them. And then finally, the only other the only change that we've done really to anything that's out there. If you'll look three lines up from the bottom, and it, it, it's in red text, but it doesn't really show up much on the screen, that's the opportunity for stakeholder comments. Um, in the action that you took a couple of months ago when we built the blueprint, we had that as the deadline as April 30th. Um, my colleagues here at the table with me and I started talking about that. That date really didn't make a whole lot of sense to us in terms of a deadline. Um, I mean, we could set the deadline, whatever it is, but this May 3rd gives a full week for stakeholders to comment, so it's just much easier for us to communicate. Um, the, the public forums happen, then the next, they have the entire next week. It shortens the time on the back end for us to produce that stakeholder comment report, but we still have ample time. We, we, didn't, we didn't need two weeks to produce the report. So. Um, we made the unilateral decision to change that date from what you had in the actual blueprint that we put together, but we've only extended the opportunity for community engagement, not restricted it. Um, and it just, we think it'll be a little easier to, to communicate and for folks to remember. So with that, I will um, entertain any questions and or uh, yield to the outstanding team to my right here who has been absolutely instrumental in helping us put all this together. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, one last slide. I want to talk about what we will um, announce on the 15th. Um, this will be the information that will be released publicly and that you all will get. So the presence on the website will include um, a professional headshot, right, an applicant photo. There'll be a little biographical caption uh, to go along with that. Then we will we will provide um, a public facing resume. We will include the applicant's cover letter into our uh, from our application system, the application narrative, and what that is re going all the way back to the work that we did on the second of February, when you crafted that I, those identified characteristics, those most desired characteristics. Inside of our application system, we list those at a, in a bulleted list, and we ask each candidate to respond in a narrative how they, how they see they best meet that criteria. So we'll extract that narrative from the, uh, it, it, it's, not all, it's not overly pretty as we take it out of this antiquated data system, but all, all of it is there. And then we will also post links to two video questions. I reference those as the deadline is tomorrow. And these are the two questions that we asked um, each candidate um, to, uh, to respond, uh, to which to respond in those videos. Um, so both of these come uh, directly off of the set of identified criteria um, that, um, you have in the in the candidate rubric and that you discuss, that we uh, put together on the second but you will they will have 4 minutes up to 4 minutes each in their produced videos that we will then link and Michelle will um, may tell you a little more about exactly how that would look but all of this will be available via hyperlink on the district's website fantastic um, before we move on um, I do have an announcement to make to the board um, and to the community. So with the support of the other points of contact and also uh, Dr. Cooper and Dr. Joel, uh, we are also providing one hour optional private sessions with all of the identified finalists with Dr. Thomas Alsbury on balanced governance. We will not know the outcome of those meetings because they are confidential between Dr. Alsbury and the finalists who opt for them. It is not a requirement. However, we will know which finalists opted for that time with him. That hour will be spent talking about balanced governance, 
questions, understanding how it aligns with them. And those sessions will take place after they have been announced or been informed that they are a finalist, but before the finalist activities begin on April 24th. Because as a reminder, we are not just looking for a new leader of our district. We are looking for a community member that will be a leader here and we want them to understand the way that we operate. So in that time, they will be able to ask personal and private questions to Dr. Allsbury about the way balanced governance works. And that individual back and forth, again, will be between those finalists and Dr. Allsbury. But um, as your point of contact, I really felt that strengthening the understanding about balanced governance was something that is our responsibility to do with these finalists. And by creating these optional opportunities for a private learning experience was very, very important in that mutual interview process, which is them learning about us, us learning about them, even if these are people that we may already know in our community one way or another. And so I wanted to share that with the board that as your point of contact, this was one of the things that we've done, and I'm looking forward to adding that step with it. And I, I thank uh, Dr. Cooper and Dr. Joel for their openness to that, and also with Dr. Alsbury, who will be doing those sessions. Thank you. And now I'll go to Vice President Mayberry yeah, before we move on to the next section. Thank you, President Smith. Uh, just a couple quick questions. I'll, I'll be brief. Um, uh, and if you can't uh, answer, uh, just, just let me know. April 4th. Um, selected candidates invited to submit videos. Is, is there a number? Can you tell us how many of those? I'd rather not tell you okay, exactly how fine. many. What I will tell you is there's, there is um, uh, a, a much larger number than will come forward as finalists. Okay. Uh, more than 20? No, I'm just kidding. No. <laughs> uh, my second question is, so uh, down here, uh, opportunity for stakeholder comments on finalists. Could you just clarify that? The, the thrust of my question is I've had some feedback that uh, from just community members that they'd like when they, the finalists come forward, they, they'd like the opportunity to, to look at them and provide comment, to provide some input. Would that be that opportunity for them so that these stakeholders aren't necessarily identified already? That's, that's my question. Thank you for that, Trustee Mayor, but that, that's a great question. So we have um, a form that we will, uh, um, that's in, within my, my Google domain, um, that's a narrative feedback form. We ask for strengths and or reservations, right, on each candidate. That form will be available to everyone who is at the public, um, for the public events, which will be at Woost. We'll talk about that a little bit, the, but it will also, those will also be recorded, and that same feedback form will be available via a hyperlink on the website, and I think as well as distributed via email. And Michelle will talk about that, um, but there, that is not a proprietary access to that. Anybody who wants to, uh, obviously they'll have to have the QR code or know where to find the link, but beyond that, anybody is welcome to provide that feedback. And then we also ask for I can't, there's either five or six demographic delineators. Are they a parent? Are they a community member, WCSD employee? Um, but, yes. that, very good question. Thank you. I just want to add a little bit for you on that, Trustee Mayberry. At our board meeting last month in March, we did display in the slide deck, so as part of the presentation materials that Dr. Cooper presented, we do have the example questions that will be a part of that feedback survey. So if members of the community are interested in seeing what the survey questions will look like, there are examples that were displayed in the slide deck in the March um, board meeting uh, that will show exactly how they will engage in those open uh, dialogue answers when they have the opportunity when it opens on April 25th. Ready for me? Uh, so Michelle Anderson, Chief Communications Community Engagement Officer. I first want to say um, for anybody that's watching online or in the audience, um, if you go to washaschools.net slash superintendent search, you're going to find the landing page for the superintendent search. But also um, on the front page of the website, you're going to see on the um, left hand side a blue box that says superintendent search. I specifically put it there, had our team put it there, because if you were uh, using a phone, it's one of the first things that 
that comes up so that you're not having to scroll through uh, the rotating photos so that it was easy for everybody to find. So when I reference um, what's going to be posted, it will be posted there. Um, so as Dr. Cooper mentioned, on April 15th, we will, um, as soon as he provides us the information, we'll upload the photo, brief bio, the videos, the cover letter, the resume, and the narrative. We will send a message out to our district staff, our families, and our community, along with our media partners, um, about the finalists and remind them of the website. We are also going to be opening up an email um, that people can submit questions for, and I'll go into detail about the Wooster event, so community members can um, submit their questions if they are unable to attend in person. Um, and then at the event, again, which I'll talk about in just a moment, uh, we will be taking comment cards during that. Um, uh, obviously, uh, Ms. Weir will speak in just a few minutes about what um, all the activities that will be going on through the 24th and 25th, but we have listened to all of you making sure that we're getting feedback um, from our employees, from our students, from our families, from our community members, for our business leaders, um, giving them the opportunity to meet the finalists. And I think also what's really important is for our finalists to learn about what our community has to offer. We heard from public commenters and all of you, our community is a great community community and they need to know um, if they're going to be um, named as a superintendent, they need to see that this works for them and what we offer. Um, the night before the event on the 24th at 5 p.m., we will shut down those email submissions for the virtual ones just so that my team can gather those. On April 24th, and again, I don't know how many candidates we'll have, so I'm giving approximate times. Um, we will have media opportunities from about 3.30 to 4.45 for each candidate, um, just like we did the last round where candidates are um, getting to be asked questions by the news media. Um, and then from 5, and I'm going to say until approximately 8.15, because again, I don't know um, how many um, candidates we will have. We will do the rotation of finalists. Um, you guys may remember how we did that at Wooster High School last time, where we have a room for community members, we have a room for families, um, so people can rotate in and out those rooms or sit in one room as they like um, and listen to those candidates come in. Um, then I will, um, for example, in the community room, like what I did last time, I will take um, questions from the audience through a comment card and then also the ones online, uh, mix them up. I think there's several members of our community that are in the audience tonight and can attest that we made sure that that was extremely fair, that whatever questions came in, we asked them, we did not change them um, so that the finalists answer those, exactly how the community, um, you know, what they're wanting. Uh, that evening, the survey that Dr. Cooper mentioned, we will give out a QR code that night um, so that uh, those that attend are able to submit comments that way. And then on the following day of the 25th, we know that people are not always going to be attending that. They can't because of prior engagement. So we will also send that survey link out through um, a message to our families, our staff, our community again, and obviously post that on her website, on our website. Um, and then May 3rd, the survey closes. Um, we will, um, as soon as we get that stakeholder report back, we will again communicate to our staff, our employee, or, I mean, our students, our employees, um, our families, and our community, um, and have that up on the, uh, the website as well. Um, Michelle, you've done an amazing job. I know Katie Louise is gonna jump in here, but the level of preparedness with your team has been outstanding. Um, and to just uh, underline something, so the community sessions will be recorded, and so then anyone who is not able to attend will be able to watch that back, and then also be informed not just based on the candidate information, but also being able to watch back each of the finalists' community forum so that they can use that as part of their feedback mechanism as well. Thank you, I forgot to include that. And then we also have interpretation services at the event for our families and our community and business leaders should they uh, need that so that everybody is able to participate. And I'll now turn it over to Katie Louise. All right, good evening Board of Trustees. So fun to talk about this. It feels like we've been building this up for a long time and now it's finally here. 
Uh, so as far as the human resources side of things to support this process, on April 15th, when the public announcement of the finalist is released, then my team will really quickly work to schedule travel arrangements for the external applicants who don't live within a reasonable travel distance to um, come here starting Wednesday. So um, those folks will fly in on Tuesday, April 23rd to ensure they're ready to go on Wednesday morning. They have three really busy, full, exciting days with us. So I'm going to give you just kind of the rough overview of what that looks like and then also speak to perhaps some distinct changes from last time to this time. One of those big changes is we are not asking you as trustee members to drive any applicants around or pick them up from the airport. I know last time that was a part of um, what we asked of each of you and, and gave you some time for that instead of for meals. Um, but we heard loud and clear that for a lot of you, it's difficult to schedule that along with work and have things be predictable. So we have very predictable set times that are the same each day as far as meals uh, to be able to engage with the finalists. So you will have an opportunity to engage with each finalist at a meal. You don't have to eat all three times if you don't want to. Um, so we'll be flexible there. But once the finalists are named, we will send individual schedules to each of you specifically. And we will say, for example, Clerk Rodriguez, here's your schedule for the three days. Here's what we... Um, would invite you to attend and these are the people you will meet with at these times but just big picture what that looks like so essentially there are like I said the meal opportunities with board of trustee members um, both days there's an opportunity on Wednesday for the finalists to meet with the executive leadership team here at central office so each of them will come individually and meet with the chiefs and other members of the executive leadership team there's going to be an opportunity on Wednesday for them to tour UNR and we'll talk about university partnerships, not just with UNR, but some of our other external partnerships uh, with some of our key community members um, in the greater, greater Nevada area. And then there will, of course, be a community welcome event with key business leaders on Wednesday evening. More details to come on that. Then Thursday, there will be school visits. So members of the executive leadership team in pairs or trios will join the finalists at school visits. They'll visit um, at least two schools within um, Washoe County School District during their time here. And then there will be the very important stakeholder forum event that uh, afternoon. Um, and another key distinct part of this that we heard from the applicants was they would like an opportunity to drive through neighborhoods. So on Thursday, we'll also have that opportunity for them. So if they're an external applicant, they would have the opportunity to either decompress in their hotel, if that's what they want, before they go to the um, community event, or they're also able to um, drive neighborhoods. And we may recruit Adam Searcy and members of his team to help us with that as well. But once we have the finalists named on April 15th, we'll communicate with them, see what their wishes are, kind of narrow that down a little bit, and then provide that as an opportunity for those who would be moving to our area. Uh, there is not a dinner scheduled on Thursday evening, and that's very intentional because Friday is when interviews start, and it will be right after that community event where they're meeting a lot of different stakeholder groups. So we're giving them that time on um, Thursday evening to decompress, catch their breath, um, and get ready for the interviews on Friday morning. Uh, so again, it's an exciting schedule. It's a busy schedule. Um, we'll be calling on members of leadership team to support, um, but human resources team will be the primary transportation to and fro for the um, external applicants. Uh, so we won't need members, uh, uh, trustee members to pick up people from the airport or anything like that. We will take care of all of that in house. That's amazing. This is the work done by this group has been really remarkable. And so in addition to what everything was just reported on right now, there are hours and hours and hours of meetings that have happened. Um, in the background, everyone has been so flexible. We've pulled forward all of our lessons learned, feedback from both applicants and the board and different community members. And I really just want to thank everyone involved with this process for being so focused on progress, doing this better and different, which reflects what we need now. And uh, just thank you so much. I, I know personally I'm very excited about this, and I'm sure that that's very true for um, all or most of my colleagues as well. 
Um, seeing no lights on, I think we're, we're done with this item. And, and just so everyone knows, more information will be coming next week because everything's kind of flexible, but once we know the number of finalists, we'll be putting final schedules together with plenty of notice through our media partners, through our families, so that we put out full schedules for everyone in advance. Thank you so much. Thank you. I know. Bravo for sure. All right, that closes item 4.01 and section 4 in its entirety and brings us now to section 5. And we'll go ahead and we will start with item 5.01, our student representatives report. Thank you, President Smith. It's been a minute. <laughs> so, um, I wanted to start by shouting out um, our staff, uh, Brad Rose, Caprice Young, and Gina Curtis, they've been working really hard to make sure that all of our high schools have student voice councils, and they did it. So every single high school now has their own council, and it's really exciting. Um, so that was one of our really big goals for this year. And then a couple middle schools as well have been growing their council, which is really awesome. Um, so Student Voice was able to go to the principals meeting on February 16th. And we kind of gave a progress report to all our principals, introduced Student Voice to some of them, um, and we were able to also tell them about the Student Voice conference that we're having on May 17th. So we had one last year, but it's going to look a little bit different this year. We had elementary school last year, but this year we're just going to do high school and middle school. Um, and we want to have students from every single high school and middle school at this conference. Something that I'm super excited about is we're going to have feeder time where um, the high schools can meet up with the middle schools that feed into there and they can kind of talk with each other and um, it'll be really good for recruitment for student voice to have some students and those high school councils coming straight in from middle school and then also just giving advice if there's middle school students that want to start a council at their middle school. So yeah, that's kind of what I have for Student Voice. We're currently just working hard to get ready for this conference. It's gonna be really awesome. Thank you so much. All right, that closes item 501. Um, and in the interest of time and the fact that we do have some public commenters, we're gonna go ahead and um, defer on item 502 and move on now to item 503, the interim superintendent's report. I will defer my time, President Smith. All right. So then that brings us to Section 6, our closing public comment. JJ? Christy Evans. Welcome, Ms. Evans. Thank you for being here. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. I guess we're almost at evening. Christy Evans, for the record, I drove the 200-mile round trip from Gerlach today to be here to talk to you about an issue of critical importance to us, and that's housing. In case you're not aware, Gerlach is in the midst of a severe housing shortage, so severe that our businesses are struggling because we can't find housing for their workers, and the impact to the Gerlach school is just as critical. We have a staff member who started in September and was homeless for six months while working at the school because there is no housing to be found. Yet, the district owns eight parcels of residential land right next to the school. These parcels, uh, there's five that are occupied and three that sit vacant with no housing unit on them. These parcels were gifted to the school district in 1983 by the town of Gerlach, specifically to provide housing to its staff. So it's a point of contention for those of us that live there who are wondering why the school district is not doing anything with their vacant land while we have a housing crisis. And I want you to imagine how it looks to our community that you have a staff member with nowhere to live, you've done nothing about the residential land, <laughs> and yet we gave you that land for the purpose of housing staff. You guys have the power to fix this. You can alleviate this housing crisis by putting units on there for staff members to rent. The Gerlach K-12 school ability to educate our children depends upon hiring staff and they need housing. The timeline here is not a couple years, it's a couple months. The school has three critical positions that are up for hire for the next school year. 
they cannot hire if there's nowhere to live. I've heard that the district is not interested in being a landlord. I get it. But Gerlach School has been providing housing for its staff since the 1960s. Gerlach is, not, is a town unlike any other in Washoe County, and Gerlach School is unlike any other in this district. Housing for our staff has always been and continues to be a necessity in rural Washoe County. So on behalf of my neighbors, who understandably can't necessarily make the drive to be here, I'm asking you today to take action on this. For what it's worth, our principal has been trying for a couple years. Nothing has been done, and so we as the community are now coming to you to say something has to be done. So thank you. Thank you very much for your advocacy. We really appreciate that. And thank you for that drive. Avery Zurich. Hi, Avery. Welcome. Thank you for being with us. Uh, hi there, I'm Avery Strink. I'm a high school senior at the Academy of Arts and Careers Technology. Uh, it's come to my attention that uh, funding for transportation, national uh, competitions, and conventions for the CTE program has been cut. I personally have competed uh, in Skills USA for the past two years, placing first in state last year, and then placing top nine in the country in the World Skills pre trials. Now, um, a comp uh, an accomplishment that the district shared uh, shared a lot through social media. Now, this. Uh, experience has been great. It's helped me a lot with not only with the technical skills, but I've also learned a lot of soft skills like my resume building, my uh, uh, social aspect of work pla workplaces. They've uh, improved tons through this. Sorry. Uh, I wanted to share my experience with the rest of my schooling there. So I've taken a huge role in both promoting Skills USA and preparing competitors. So I've loaned out personal gear and it's good because these kids are driven. They've uh, the ones competing this year, actually tomorrow. They have spent a significant amount of their spring break at TMCC training as much as they can. And it is an absolute kick in the face to not only me, but my teachers and everyone else who's worked to make sure those students are national competition ready to say that they can't make it without funding. So I, I please beg you, uh, provide the funding that was promised so then we can build our CTE program. Thank you. Thank you very much, Avery. We appreciate you being here. Karen Surik. Hi, Ms. Surik. Welcome. Thank you all for sticking around. My name is Karen Surik. I'm a parent of Washoe County School District students, including Avery. Um, it has come to my attention today that effective immediately, the CTE department will not fund students to attend national CTE conventions and competitions. This decision impacts students preparing to attend Pro Start Culinary Invitational, Family, Career, and communi Community Leaders of, of America, Health Occupation Students of America, Skills USA, Future Farmers of America, Future Business Leaders of America, and many more conferences. Not only are these events um, educational, providing students a venue to learn valuable lessons and test their mettle among the best in the country, they're also life-changing opportunities for students to receive mentoring and make connections with industry leaders. Students work very hard during school and after hours to qualify to participate in these events. They have to earn the privilege of attending and countless hours going into preparing them to compete at this level. I am a parent volunteer organization member that fundraises to support these students attending these events. We work very hard, but we can only do so much. And your decision against funding this is a terrible blow. By turning your back on these students, you have left us in a position where only students whose parents can afford airfare, accommodations, and registration fees will be able to benefit from these events. So tell me, where is the equity in that? Our CTE teachers and their students have been operating under the promise that CTE department would cover the cost of attending these events. Our teachers sacrificed their own time to prepare our students. Many of them gave up their entire spring breaks. They do this work with no reimbursement because their hearts are in their jobs. Now, their blood, sweat, and tears has been obliterated overnight because of or misappropriation of funds. We are weeks away from these events. 
and to have the rug pulled out from under us has created a situation where some students might not get to participate because of their family's economic situation. These students are the people who will be designing, building, and staffing the infrastructure and services that we will all depend on in the future. You have an opportunity before you. You can abandon them or you can support them. Our district has happily claimed taking part in Avery's success on social media, and rightfully so. His teacher is phenomenal, but it's time for you to put your money where your mouth is. We're just weeks away from this event, and I would like to speak briefly to Dr. McNeil's point about defending the, D the DEI department because there are employees behind those decisions. There are about 100 CTE teachers and thousands of students who you told today are not a priority. Thank you very much, Ms. Sarek. We appreciate you being here. Hey, everyone. Thank you. Carl Koplick. Welcome again, Mr. Koplick. Hello again. Carl Koplick, for the record. Um, still here from Gerlach, Nevada, 100 miles each way. Um, I will not try to endeavor not to beat the horse um, again um, and speak to something new, and that is the value of Gerlach and what it means to Washoe County. We are a remote frontier community. Um, <clears throat> what is Gerlach? Why is it relevant and why should you even fund a school out there? Uh, for starters, the, the roads that are plowed uh, out of Gerlach cover an immense area between Pyramid Lake, basically, and the Oregon border. Uh, <clears throat> That is, that outpost of county maintenance is vital. The interstate commerce that piles through Gerlach is going to be, is completely maintained by the, the, the work that's done by our county maintenance facility. Further, the Burning Man Festival, which brings tens of millions of dollars of sales tax revenue, is based out of Gerlach, Nevada. There's a cadre of the almost 40, 50 people that are permanently based there that provide a huge amount of labor year-round to provide for, that are the infrastructure and the backbone of that festival. Uh, whenever you pull open a, a piece of literature is touting Washoe County, the first thing you see is Burning Man. It might not be popular with everybody, but it's certainly kind of popular with the people who g generate revenues for this place. Um, Next, that school itself is a magnet and a beacon to the, the area. The infrastructure that has been developed in that area, in, in the school, and, and what it provides to the region, and the Empire Mine that sits contiguous to Gerlach is absolutely vital. Uh, that mine is, is, was, until the economic crisis shut it down for a short while, the oldest continuing operating mine in the state. That place is in business since the turn of the century. It, and its ability to attract its workforce is contingent on the quality of the education that's it, it produced in Gerlach, and that quality of education is contingent on the housing stock in Gerlach. So we beseech you all to step up and improve what we have there and not let it slip further into the abyss. That, that is my long story short. And lastly, since we're talking about athletics, Gerlach has no athletics whatsoever. It is walking in the woods. Well, actually, we have no woods. It's walking in the desert. Um, <laughs> and, and I encourage you all to come out and join us. Um, we actually, it's, it's a tourist attraction out there. And the infrastructure to staff that tourist economy is contingent again on having a school to draw the magnet, to, to draw the population so we don't become a ghost town or the next worst thing which is a, a town that's upside down economically and just hanging on by our fingernails. Thank you very much. Appreciate Thank you. It. Thank you very much, Mr. Kobeck. We appreciate you being here and speaking twice, truly. Valerie Fianaka. Welcome again, Ms. Fianaka. Thank you. Almost dinner time. Um, I just learned about this CTE situation as Karen was speaking, but my business and my two oldest sons just spent well, my business donated all the supplies for this FFA competition, and my son spent an entire weekend to judge and host the horticultural competition um, for the FFA. And I think those 400 kids that competed, not all 400 of them won, obviously, but that's got to be an absolute letdown to those kids. They came from all over the state, by the way. They're not just from Reno. They came from all over the state to compete here in Reno. And back to what I was going to say before Karen did her thing. 
we have a real disparity between our proficiency scores and our graduation rates and at one of these meetings i would really 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 like to get an in depth explanation from whomever you guys want to call in here to explain that to me because they don't meet up anywhere in my mind and i don't understand how how that jives every meeting i hear nothing but back slapping and congrats and i appreciate that positivity but some realism would be greatly appreciated especially for those of you running for re-election we got to start talking about it at some point you can't just have an 83 percent graduation rate and only 40 percent of the kids are proficient in math that somewhere doesn't line up at some point you have to get the kids failed and have them learn the material you can't just keep passing them along and graduating them and telling us that it's all okay mrs fianaka it all matches up it doesn't match up and it doesn't match up or explain to me how it matches up because i might just not be getting it i might be stiff in the head i might be getting old we all know i'm getting old thank you very much Ms. fianaka sandy tibbet welcome Ms. tibbet So I look forward to the day when I can come to this podium and praise a board of trustees who actually have demonstrated an unwavering commitment to protecting our children from sexual predators like the ALA. Sold is about a 13 year old girl who is sold into the sex industry by her father and she's held captive at a brothel and has to prostitute herself in order to pay her debt. This is not content for middle schoolers, but unfortunately it is in five of our middle schools, along with all the high schools. Child sex trafficking right there. Lawn, lawn boy. The school district's website describes this as about a young American Mexican or Mexican American not too many years out of high school. I feel that you've used that description to appeal to younger readers because in reality, he is a 22 year old who is struggling to find a job with no means of transportation and lives in a shed on his mother's property and takes care of his mentally ill brother. What high schooler is going to relate to this content? Nowhere in the description of this book does it say it also contains vulgar language and you can see I passed out some handouts. You can read it if you care. Obviously you don't. So it contains the vulgar language, drug use, drinking and driving, lo losing one virginity, dick sucking in the fourth grade and liking it. I provided you a page 91 so you can read it for yourself. So how long before this one is in our middle schools? Or is it already hidden in a teacher's private collection? It doesn't belong in the schools. Page 66, out of darkness. Shh, he said. He took one of her hands in his and squeezed, come on over here. He pulled her to her feet, close to him. He shifted in his pajamas and the part of him that made him a man stuck out, reddish, purple, and frightening. She had never seen one before except on a baby. This was different. He lifted her hand to his mouth and licked it. Then he lowered her hand down and closed it around the hardness. His hand moved hers. This left hand gripped her shoulder, pressing her head against the hard, flat plane of his stomach. She watched her hand move back and forth like it didn't belong to her. In the distance, she heard the train pass. A moment later, the thing leaped. Henry's whole body shuddered and a hot mess lay across her palm and between her fingers. Henry wiped himself quick, quickly with the handkerchief. Thank you very much, Ms. Tibbet. We appreciate you. Doesn't belong in the schools. Thank you, Ms. Tibbet. That's your you warning. You need to get rid of it. This Please. needs to go on the agenda immediately. We're done. Thank you, Ms. Tibbet. Please don't make me do it. Please leave. We appreciate it. Yeah, your and comment. I want you to take these books Order. out of the schools. Recess. Out of the schools. I will be quiet. We'll all be quiet when you take these, these books out of the schools. You need to be 
be arrested for trying.
right, everyone. <laughs> All right, it's 6.05 p.m. on Tuesday, April 9th, 2024. I'm going to call back to order this regular meeting of the Washoe County School District Board of Trustees. With a reminder to all of our guests that this is a public business meeting of the Washoe County School District and we're in service to kids. We had a fascinating conversation today about bullying and behavior and the things that we saw. I'm gonna give everybody a warning and then I'll have you removed, please. This is decorum. So for all, everyone in the audience, please. So as you come up to give your public comment, we're very interested in what you have to say. You'll have three minutes. And then I would really prefer to not have to provide warnings to anyone, but I will provide one, and then you will be asked to leave. Thank you so much. JJ, can we please continue? Stuart Handel. Stuart Hanty, sorry. Welcome, Mr. Hanty. Welcome. Yeah, I'm, just, I'm just really kind of appalled about what just took place here. I've lived in this valley for almost 50 years. I went to high school here when school was fun when people respected one another, when students respected one another, when students respected teachers, and now you have this garbage that takes place here with sex trafficking, pornography and books, drugs, violence taking place in schools. There's a root problem, and it's all in your shoulders. All in your shoulders. And I know some of you in this room. What are you doing about it? I don't have any kids in school. I'm up here to make some general statements. And I'm really disgusted I have to come up here and make general statements. You all should be ashamed of yourselves for not doing what's right and taking the, the, the problems by the horns and taking care of them or allowing students to be murdered, beaten up, to, teachers to be beaten up, drugs to be rampant, gang problems. I'm just disgusted. You only care about your, your salaries and your positions. Susan Enfield was a red herring, folks. Did you guys get all buffaloed by that? Really? Oh gosh, I was so hurt about she wanted a $48,000 cost of living increase from a $350,000 salary. Please, come on. Who gets to have a $350,000 salary and boot scoop boogie two years later? Yeah, my heart goes out to her. I want to make one more final statement. I know Sergeant Jeff Church for many years, 30 plus, I believe, Sergeant Jeff, 30 plus. What you people are doing against him is reprehensible conduct. You all should be ashamed of yourselves. In fact, you ought to just take a look at the mirror. But I doubt when you look at the mirror, you'll see a reflection. Thank you, Mr. Handy. Jeff Church. Welcome, Mr. Church. Hello, Jeff Church. Uh, couldn't speak for board report, so here I am. Number one, I'm going to put on the record the third page of the Mr. Gomez's application that states that these are public records. Got a couple nice pictures here uh, taken at board meetings where we posed for pictures, some pretty good ones. Looks like it was probably taken by our photographer using department time, department resources. Great pictures, except they're on Vote Joe Rodriguez website. Vote Joe Rodriguez, Twitter, X, whatever you want to call it. Mr. Rodriguez, you do not have my permission to use my picture on your website. I do not endorse you. Please remove it. Please do not use department resources for your election. So what I really want to talk about, I have for each of you simply 19 pages, not hard to read. I was subjected to 90 minutes of personal attack at the last meeting with no ability to really defend myself. So there it is. Please read it. It's only 19 pages. I go over it in detail why it was false accusations, why many of my complaints were founded. I'd love to have 90 minutes. I'd love to have 30 minutes to go over them. The most important part comes on page 18. You folks did not recuse yourself. You did not disclose pecuniary interest that you're running for reelection, that you were represented pro bono by McDonald Carano, who represents the district. We paid him about $130,000 last year. Most importantly, as I reported last time, there was a whistleblower 
I asked to put that information on the record, and the lawyer said I couldn't. Well, here I am. That whistleblower spoke to me on, in person and specifically implemented Board President Smith in the conspiracy against me to fabricate. And those pictures are right there. I, I was nowhere near those two women. I was sitting right there when that incident happened. The whistleblower indicates that Trustee President Smith personally conspired against me. No wonder she voted to, to not have an investigation. She has a pecuniary interest in this. We are prepared to release the name of that whistleblower so you can investigate, but of course you don't want to. Go through there. I've got 32 seconds. Various complaints. Said I didn't, said I had to pay attorney fees to the city. Judge rules, city of Reno must pay police officers legal fees. You said I had four complaints while I was a trustee. I had one, factually wrong. When are you going to apologize? What you, what you acted on was factual misinformation and under Robert's Rules of Orders, you can rehear that. You can reopen it now that you have the facts here. You have, you have 14, 19 pages. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Church. John Eppolito. Welcome, Mr. Eppolito. Wow, mine's not gonna be near as exciting. John Eppolito, uh, teacher, six years. Um, now I'm with Protect Nevada Children. You can find 1,500 of us on Facebook at Protect Nevada Children. Um, I was listening to the presentation earlier about the bullying, and uh, this is one of the, I have four kids, and they've all gone through the district. And this is one of the reasons I kept my kids off of cell phones until they were 16. Unfortunately, the school district somewhat got involved, and for my second child, I had to um, get her a cell phone when she was 15 because she needed it for school. So part of the problem is you guys, not only are you not helping with the solution, you're getting these kids on these devices. And I think a couple of us know for years, the kids have been using their district issued devices to watch inappropriate content, including pornography. And you guys know that. And, and you never take responsibility for it. The last time was at um, Nick Polakitas Elementary where elementary school students figured out how to use their district issued devices to watch pornographic videos on Pornhub. The district doesn't take responsibility for this. You punish the children, kind of, um, and it's very problematic. You guys are the problem many times, not the solution, unfortunately, and you could be. And I got a little bit of time to talk about the data. A month or so ago, I sent you guys an article from NPR that says why people want the student data. And I know some of you are concerned about it, but we never get to have a public discussion about it. And we're way past time. And in that video was a little different than the text. So if you go back, if you want me to resend it, I'll resend it. But the I think the video had more than the text. And um, it's very problematic. And in our school district, the data lives in infinite campus. We all know that. Nobody seems to care except a handful of us. And if People want to understand Infinite Campus. But well, well, Infinite Campus is the most massive database ever created on children in human history. And it's not just grades and attendance. It's medical, psychiatric, discipline. And, and this stuff lives forever. And a lot of it is shared with the state, the SANE system. But if people want to s somewhat understand why Infinite Campus is so harmful, I love when you guys just look down when we talk. It's it's it's. It's disrespectful, Kristen, that data in Infinite Campus, if you want to understand it a little bit, you can go to protectnevadachildren.org, protectnevadachildren.org. And if you have kids in the school that are under 18, you can request in the bottom of that, on that web page, there's a way to request all the data that will be stored on your kids forever. John Eppolito, Protect Nevada Children, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Eppolito. Bruce Foster. Welcome, Mr. Foster.
Yeah, good afternoon, Bruce Foster for the record, and here we go again. Why am I here? First of all, I just read an article in uh, This Is Reno, the liberal rag that we can get online, that uh, syphilis and STDs are exponentially going uh, through the roof here in the state of Nevada. Another uh, point that I wish to bring up is, my word, uh, there's another article that parents don't trust teenage babysitters. Wonder why that is, huh? And then I see that we have men here, I'll use the term loosely, and they may have teenage uh, daughters, and I'm just wondering if parents would allow them to babysit, knowing that these men, minus one, would allow and continue allow, as we've been working on feverishly, to get these pornographic, sexually explicit books out of the schools. I have a book here that I brought. It's uh, Looking for Alaska. It's in all your high schools, and it is uh, on uh, basically ALA Banned Books Week Challenge in Washoe County Libraries, and it's under uh, young adult, uh, uh, young adult uh, uh, verbiage there. And I just do have a, a few uh, choice uh, uh, pages that I can read, but this is all about a very promiscuous uh, young gal that is, her name's uh, uh, Alaska, and all her uh, tricks and escapades uh, with another guy called Pudge. And if you can imagine closing your eyes and a 14-year-old reading this, and we found plenty of porn magazine haphazardly stuffed in between mattresses and box springs. It turns out that Hank Walston did uh, like something other than basketball and pot. He liked jugs. But we didn't find the, a movie until Room 32, The Bitches of Madison County. Well, ain't that just de delightful? We ran uh, with it to the TV room, closed the blinds, locked the door, and watched the movie. It opened with a woman standing on a bridge with her legs spread while a guy knelt in front of her, giving her oil sex. Mr. Foster, this is your warning, please. And a woman Feel free to read the portions hands. of the book that uh, aren't sexually explicit. President Smith, I thought I this gave you a, uh, you know, a lesson on our First Amendment right, and you're infringing four out of my five. She kept saying, give it to me, and moaning, and though her eyes, brown and blank, betrayed thank her Thank you, Mr. Foster. Okay, thank you, but the Thank you, Mr. Foster, your, your time is up. Perverse. Janet Butcher. Welcome, Ms. Butcher. Janet Butcher, for the record, please enter my comments uh, verbatim per NRS. Um, find it interesting that you would have to jump up and waddle out like little ducks out of the room for listening to something that you are allowing children to read. So if you say, oh, this is a business meeting, I'm sorry, uh, Ms. Smith, if I'm interrupting your writing, um, that um, it can't be read, but you're allowing these children to read it. Next thing I want to talk about is a couple years ago, I, can't, I was at one of the meetings, and I watched Angie Taylor get up here and malign um, trustee Church, thank you. <laughs> See what happens when you get 76? Um, anyway, that she, but uh, she was like this and that, and she was like, eh, eh, eh. but at least last meeting when the uh, attorney did his litigation, he didn't jump around and act like a fool. So uh, this has been going on against um, Trustee Church. His people voted for him. His constituents voted for him, and you guys don't like him because he doesn't, he wants to make a good difference. 
You guys want to hire somebody that's going to fold into your mold. I disagree with that guy or whatever one of you said that we need somebody that's going to fit into our little compartment. We need somebody that's going to come here and fix the school system. It's atrocious. The next thing is last um, trustee, when the trustees from a different district ran, I asked the question, were they going to use this as a, 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 a board to jump into the next election or the next thing up? And I guess um, Trustee Rodriguez is. And then last, um, I think that as president, Beth Smith, since she is campaigning, should not be running these meetings. It's unethical. She should resign as president. Thank you, Ms. Butcher. The board received emails from Colby Reardon with the Washoe Schools Principals Association, Lena Courtney, Seth Schrenzel, Amy Katz, Tony McMillan with the Washoe Professional Technical Association, Judy Conley, Zoe Bray, Linda Miller, and Dr. Abigail Harper. Thank you so much. All right, that closes our public comment period and now moves us on to 602, our next meeting announcement, which is Tuesday, April 23rd, 2024. And then item 603, adjournment at 621. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.